We're talking today with Daniel Bro of Fendel, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Now, can you begin with some background on yourself? Uh, to start with, where and when were you born? I was born in Allegan, Michigan in 1949. Uh, uh, lived uh, in this area here most of my life. As a matter of fact, my service time was probably the only time of any extended time that I was away from here. Mm -hmm. And what was your family doing for a living during the time you were growing up? Uh, well, my parents were, were divorced when I was quite young, mm -hmm. my real parents. My mother remarried in 1955. Uh, he had a 40-acre farm that he had been trying to maintain at the time, but there was so, uh, what would you say, he took on myself and my brother, and all of a sudden to go to a family of four, that 40-acre farm wouldn't cut it, but mm -hmm. uh, he went to work in a, a factory here in Holland that made uh, registers and everything, Hart and Cooley. And then eventually he went into truck driving jobs and stuff like that. My mom stayed at home. She didn't work outside the home. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. And then what kind of education did you have? Uh, I managed to complete high school. Uh, I guess you'd have to call it quite reluctantly. I was very disillusioned with high school early on and of course that made it very difficult to keep up with it and to do things mm -hmm. with it. Uh, now were you working at the same time? Yes, I did. I had, I had a uh, job at the grocery store here in Pineville. Uh, I worked there after school and on weekends. Uh, I even stayed there for Boy, almost nine months, nine, ten months after I got out of school, I just stayed right there at it. But uh, eventually I wanted to get to making more money and doing something different, so I had taken up welding and gotten real good at it and everything. So went to work for an outfit called Case Master Body in Holland, uh, making half-ton military trailers, of all things. All right. Uh, so, and then... Uh, how long did you work at that job before your draft notice came? Oh, I had moved from that job. I, I was I gone to a, a place called Romer Yachts that made a, what do you call it, luxury lot? Right. Yachts. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I was working there when I actually got the draft notice. Uh, that came in uh, somewhere around February, March. Of 1969. Okay. Now, at that point, how much did you know about what was going on in Vietnam or about the draft or all the rest of that? At that time, very much. Well, very intently, as much as you could get on, like, the 6 o'clock news mm -hmm. and stuff. Uh, I had been watching it since we first started getting involved. While I was still in high school, we had a local fellow to... Uh, two of them that uh, went over and were killed in action over there. Uh, one was a Marine, the other was an Army. Mm -hmm. I believe he was a medic. I think that's what he was doing at the time. But it was for this small town, having a couple of things like it happen, it kind of brought everybody's awareness around to it. And that seemed to be the... Uh, in the back of everybody's mind, we didn't talk about it all the time or anything like that, but it, everybody was acutely aware that there was a draft, that we were becoming eligible for it every day, getting closer to that, and we would soon have to be at a point where we'd make a decision what we were going to do. Mm -hmm. Now, did you have any view yourself of, of, of the war itself, or did you know what you were going to do if you got called? That I did not. I, I uh, Not extensively. Uh, the thought of war, going to war, is kind of scary, but yet it still had that kind of, I guess, romanticism that you call it, that, that people talk about in, in different books and stuff I've read about. Uh, it was something that, well, like I said before, you know, you knew it was coming, and I, I would, had determined I wasn't going to run from it or anything of that nature. I was just going to take my turn at the draft. Mm -hmm. Uh, kind of a mixed uh, feeling about that even. Uh, I thought that if I if I waited and got drafted that would mean there would be one less person around here that would get drafted that maybe 
had a direction of a family or something like that. I didn't. I was pretty much a loner and stayed alone a lot. Uh, and did you think, did you know much about why we were in Vietnam in the first place? No, that, uh, we'd, you'd see what was in the papers, you'd hear the rumors, uh, the stopping the spread of communism mm -hmm. was one line, other ones were saying well, we're protecting financial interests of influential people in key places mm -hmm. and it was, and I, I guess deep down you knew it was a combination of all the things but it depended on what speech was being made what day, which mm -hmm. part came out strongest. So the main thing was basically that, that the country called and you had to go? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would, that's the, I, that seemed to be the, the trait for most of us. Of course, we were all trying to look for different ways, you know, look at the different ways, I guess, that there were to get around the draft, to, to avoid it some way or another. And when I looked at those for myself, they just didn't seem practical. It didn't, it didn't seem to me like it was a good thing to move, uh, like to Canada or someplace, uh, or, you know, to run from it, especially when you'd hear the stories, well, they'll come after you, they'll get you, finally, eventually you'll have to do time for it or whatever. It seemed like it was a lot easier just to go ahead and go when it came time. All right. So after you get the notice, then what's the, what's the first thing you, you do for this? Do you go in for a physical, or has that happened already? Or uh, well, we had the physical when you when you first turned eighteen, you had to register, mm -hmm. and I don't remember the margin of time, but within a certain amount of time after that, they called you up. You went over to Detroit. You spent uh, two or three days over there going through this physical process and all this. Uh, I guess. For, registering more completely, getting mm -hmm. into the system further. You did more than just leave your name at the county seat at that right. point. You know, There's a lot more to it. And, and were there people who were at that stage were, were trying to do different things to get themselves disqualified? Or were you <laughs> oh yeah, the night, the night before the physical everybody goes out on the town and Detroit was not shy about allowing underage people to get pretty well liquored up and everything and of course, everybody tried to get their blood pressure to the right caliber, or <laughs> get them kicked out. I guess the next day. And as far as I think they knew that they mm -hmm. covered for it. They they knew how to get around it. So, all right, I'd seen that all before. <laughs> all right, okay. So then, uh, now now that you have been called, do you go and report to to Detroit, or do you go somewhere yeah, else? Yes, so went to Detroit. And this is the second call. This mm -hmm. is when the official letter yeah. came. It yeah. said greeting your friends and neighbors, which I don't know what they had to do with it, but anyway, uh, we went over to Detroit, uh, and I'm not sure how many people were there that day, but when I, if I go through the procedure of how I wound up in the Marine Corps, uh, I'm assuming there were somewhere around 40 to 50 people being screened in that day. Uh, we were lined up and we were told to count off by fives, which started the biggest scramble. Uh, it almost looked like a scene out of like the Keystone Cops or something. Everybody trying to cut in, trying to do a real quick count and then be something else other than what number they were, and they kept jumping around. And I just looked at it and thought, this is ridiculous, and I just stood my ground, so I came out the first number five. And that uh, they, after we had counted off, they they had everybody go back to sit down and they started calling off ones numbered such and such and they would it was like two names at a time they would call off and uh, they would go to various rooms around this big open area we'd be sitting on these benches then they called off eight names all at once mine being the first uh, took us off into this room that we went into, it was a conference room that was barely big enough for the table. And we all squeezed in there and everything, and, I, and an Army PFC, I believe he was, just came in and said, you eight have been selected for the United States Marine Corps. And he said, does, it, does anyone have an absolute, you know, objection of why, or reason why they cannot serve? And I don't know, I just 
why I was being a smart aleck, but I just said, because I don't want to, and he said, no, that's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then I guess I go. <laughs> and he gave us a rundown on what was going to come up and how, what our activities would be the rest of the day. The uh, All the Army inductees that had been waiting for their transportation and stuff, I remember looking out the window and I saw a couple of guys from here in town out picking up, you know, policing up the area outside uh, the building there. And we were just kept together all the time, um, the, the eight of us. We were just, and we were moved from room to room to different things. We went to a, we had the swearing in and everything. Oh, before that, uh, they did ask, they said there is one selection that you can have. You can either go to Paris Island or San Diego. And there's Blackfell in our group, and he wanted, he said, well, he'd rather go to Paris Island because it's closer to home. And I said, I said, I'm not really positive about this, but I says, I don't think we're going to be coming home very quickly. I don't think it's going to be the same thing as in the Army. And the Army PFC pretty much backed me up and told him, no, it wouldn't be that way. And I said, well, in that case, I opt for the good weather. I'm going to go, I want to go to San Diego. And he said, well, I can't split you, so if you all want to do that. And they all decided that that's what they wanted to do. So uh, we commenced to heading for San Diego. Okay, but physically how do they get you out there? Do they fly you out? Uh, they, we took a bus to Metro, Detroit Metro Airport. We flew from there to Chicago. We had to get off the plane while they refueled again. Uh, got back on, same plane, and we arrived in San Diego. Well, this is late in the evening. It was, it was getting dark and everything. Uh, because they, they burn up most of the day with everything they did there in Detroit. Mm -hmm. It was just, it was phenomenal. I guess we were getting our first taste of the hurry up and wait thing, you know. It just seemed like it took forever. Now, what, what kind of reception did you get when you arrived in San Diego? <laughs> I'm probably, I don't know how many Marines you've interviewed or how many, but I'm sure they're all familiar with what we called the Night of the Yellow Footprint. Uh, when, well, when we first got there into the airport, uh, a master sergeant, it was, or a first sergeant, got, was there to greet us, and greet us, uh, told us to line up, shut up, and everything else, had us packed right next to you where your nose is on the guy's neck in front of you and everything, and uh, just said, when I, when I give you the order to step forward, you lead off with your left foot, that's what you'll do all the time, and, and you won't say a word unless spoken to, and all that stuff, and of course, there's other people in this air terminal watching this all going on, and they're just, they're, they're totally amazed at what, what's happening here, I mean, the only thing he didn't do, like they did in the rest of my training thing, is he didn't beller it right then, but he was very firm, and you knew he meant business. So they marched us out into this thing they called a cattle car, and that's a little semi, uh, single axle tractor and a, a van type affair in the back with doors right in the center, two, two doors that opened up. And inside are just simple benches. Uh, put us in there, and of course, then we start driving, and you can feel the vehicle turning, turning, turning. You have no idea where you're going, where you've been. You can't see anything. And they come to a stop, and then this other uh, individual, who is bigger than the doors are, stands right in the doorway and, does, and lets everybody know that when he wants you to off the bus, out of the or out of the cattle car, they called it. Uh, they better move and we'll be to the last one that's off and by the way if anybody touches him on the way out <laughs> we'll be to them and like i said he's bigger than the door so <laughs> you know it's going to happen i mean you'd see some really creative twisting and turning everybody coming out of there but uh every two or three guys get it and of course then they go through the routine of getting on their case and everything and it's just it was just kind of a prelude of things to come. It, it, it didn't matter what they told you to do or how they told you to do it. You could do it just exactly that way, but there's going to be something wrong with it regardless. And you're going to stand to for it. All right, so you get off the bus, then what? Yeah, and lined up, uh, then went through the various things of uh, 
of marching us well we first got we got a sea bag and we went into one place where we took off all our civilian clothes and they gave us a basic issue of uh, a pair of trousers a sweatshirt uh, some skivvies uh, like I think three sets of everything and uh, we went and got a, of course had the haircut uh, uh, all the time, though, we've, we've been instructed you don't say a word unless there's something that, that you miss in, in the issue or something, uh, you, and you bring it to them. And, of course, I, I know people have heard the, the line, the first word out of your mouth, last word out of your mouth, be sir, and that, that's where it all started, right, from the moment you got there. And was this all going on that night when you got there? Yes. Before mm -hmm. you go to sleep or anything else like that? So the yellow footprints are those are painted on the park in the pavement yeah. or whatever, yep. right outside the bus. Yeah, on the ground, what they call the grinder, the parking mm -hmm. lot that's yeah. right out in front of the receiving barracks. There. So you stand there first and get the first round of instructions, and then uh, or you, whatever. Well, you keep it. returning to that oh, all okay. that time. Okay. You, this this went on uh, all that night uh, into around midday the next day they finally decided well maybe we ought to have something to eat so they herded us up to uh, another one of the mess hall areas where we were we set our gear uh, one guy had to stay and watching it uh, they gave the explanation that the uh, the Marine Corps, there was a time when you could leave $5,000 on a bunk and nobody would touch it, but those days were gone. And therefore, they had to like post a, a, what they call a fire watch at, mm -hmm. at any kind of an event where we walked away from equipment. Uh, and that was true till all the way through training mm -hmm. and everything. But uh, they marched us into the chow thing, and of course we went through this ritual of of uh, everybody does things as a unit, as a one, as a one piece. Uh, that was even when you you set down your tray, and then they said, "Ready, seats," and you all were to hit the bench at the same time. Well, you can imagine with everybody just coming in, we're dead tired. Nobody's nobody knows what's going on for sure. Everybody's scared beyond their mind or out of their mind about what's going on. Uh, they they went through this ready seats thing about 20 times trying to get that they wanted to hear that one slap when everybody hit and that was it and it took us forever to get but we finally got it and then we had to sit there you had to sit there in a form of an of attention looking straight ahead you didn't look at anything else and they would say ready eat and you literally got one about one spoonful in and going for the second one and they said get up get out that was it and you didn't dare take another bite or anything like that you just had the tray in both hands and get up you went out discarded what was left on it which was everything and back into the formation back to the receiving barracks to get some other issued items and stuff that were that were going to be needed and that went on uh, all afternoon and everything until at one point all of a sudden we were issued linens so we had kind of I was getting suspicious then that we're gonna get near some kind of a bed sooner or later here now <laughs> and uh, they took us uh, to an area and these old Quonset huts which were uh, covered with corrugated sheet metal mm -hmm. and like a lot of roofing you see that's what they were constructed with very well used you could tell there have been thousands and thousands of people in and out of them uh, we divided up into squads and everything and then, okay this will be your squad bay here this will be your you know this will be second squad here and anyway we got in there they they went through an instruction of how to make the rack so we had to make that the first thing and made it all up and everything and I mean I don't remember what went on after that there was some more stuff in and out in and out you know get on the road get mm -hmm. go on back get on the road and everything at a dead run you know continually and 
and finally we we did wind up to get we wound up laying down in the wreck about one o'clock in the morning that would be the following day it was just from when we had left Detroit and did you have any more food besides that one bite not there no not anything till the breakfast routine the next morning Wow. Uh, which was only next morning was only probably three and a half hours four hours away uh, it, it at the time, you know, you're wondering what's going on. You think, oh, what is this? This is total insanity. How can anybody do this? But there's a purpose behind every bit of it that they do. And uh, if you can get through it and you can survive it and get to try to understand the purpose that is there, you're successful. You make it. And and it does it does make a difference I believe I, you know I, I think our discipline content was very much higher than uh, the Army I know it's higher than the Air Force and <laughs> you know it's just uh, yep. it's amazing how yep. they do it okay now how long was the boot camp uh, 13 weeks okay at our point okay so it's 13 so not including uh, anything up at Pendleton or anything yes else. there was two weeks of that that was spent at Pendleton on the rifle range mm -hmm. uh, the live firing and everything where you qualified with your weapon and everything mm -hmm. everyone had to qualify uh, every marine is a rifleman first then whatever they do after that their specialty they you know they work at that and everything but they always have to requalify with uh, weapons okay. and weapons now, before you went up for the rifle training, and while you're still at the depot in San Diego, was there kind of a daily routine for those, you know, first 11 weeks or whatever? Pretty much. Uh, uh, it was broken down into, uh, well, you get get up, you'd go out, fall in and everything. You would uh, usually do a run, uh, first thing. Do a run, come back, have chow. Uh, then it would be either you would be going out on the grinder to do drill exercises to work learn to work together and everything and uh, work as one unit and uh, you had classes and everything uh, everything from you know maintaining your rifle to uh, Marine Corps history was a big one uh, just basically teaching you everything you needed to know. Everything eventually would get covered that you needed to know how to do. Uh, there were some hints to some stuff as you were going along because you had to kind of know how to do some of this stuff. Uh, you, you would know how to do certain things but not know the reason behind it until later on. Uh, how much physical training was there? Oh, every day. Every day you went through a physical routine that uh, and of the calisthenics and everything usually before the run you do the calisthenics mm -hmm. then you take off and go on a run then come back and, and when you got back off that it was a, usually do a three mile uh, not the first couple of weeks you worked up to the three miles you know the first couple of weeks but uh, it didn't take long to get to it okay. uh, now, how easy or hard was it for you to adjust to life in the Marines Actually, I think I was adjusting better than some of the guys did, uh, but I had no delusions about it either. Like when I mentioned the black fellow in Detroit that mm -hmm. was saying about home on leave, mm -hmm. I knew that the, our, we were in for something totally different than what, uh, what at least what he was expecting. Uh, he, he was going through a very eye-opening experience. And... Uh, I knew that it was going to be different. It was going to be more difficult, more physical. Uh, and I also knew that, I think deep down, that there was only one reason I was there, and that was to become that rifleman that they say everybody mm -hmm. becomes. So, uh, not a lot of delusions about it. And a lot of things I thought about it were, they came about. They were, they became, be the truth, you know. Now, uh, were there people who washed out or were recycled through or? Yeah, we had one fellow. Uh, during my course uh, through MCRD, I wound up with actually two different platoons, uh, which I can get into in a mm -hmm. few minutes. Uh, one fellow we had, he was from Texas, a little slow. Uh, 
he was an enlisted guy. He did. He signed up for it on his own. But uh, to say the drill, the drill instructors were sadistic. Well, okay, they got up to one step, just this side of being sadistic. Mm -hmm. And uh, this fellow, he couldn't. Anything he did was wrong. Uh, he he would always get singled out and be made the example of. Uh, they would they would also pick others, but I mean he was seemed to be the primary target of them all the time. And we had a very tough, hard driving uh, the the platoon commander they call him. There's a platoon commander, then he had two or three assistant drill mm -hmm. instructors that worked. They worked around the clock. Somebody was always there that way. And uh, he was very, very uh, extreme. And he he used to pick this bell out and, and really give him uh, hard time. Hard time. He he actually hurt him is what finally happened. Uh, we were stamping our clothes of all things. Uh, they had these like hand rubber stamps that you put the letters of your name in and you tap it on the uh, ink pad and put it on the clothing and the rolled edge of the stamp holder that held the letter woe be to you if you got ink on that and when you stamped the clothing you left what they call this railroad track on top and body of your name. Of course, Hathaway, he did a railroad track right off the bat. When we were in those kind of sessions, we were usually like sitting on our foot lockers outside our squad bays right there. We were on the road in front of them. There was a platform that stood about, oh, maybe three and a half, four feet from the ground that the instructor would stand or sit up there on. A He'd usually sit on a chair and. Uh, Hathaway had done it wrong. He, they called him up in front. Of course, looked at it and everything. And this this big, heavy set instructor hauled off and kicked him right in the chest. Made an awful sound, and it got everybody's attention. Saw what happened. He, of course, hobbled back and. Was, there was no way he could, that ink was permanent, so there was no way he could get rid of it once it was there. But uh, he was still continuing to make an issue of it and everything. And uh, at night, when just before we'd hit the rack, uh, we'd been to the showers, everybody's all cleaned up. You'd stand up on your foot locker, the drill instructor would walk behind you and touch your lower back. And if you felt that you needed to go to sick bay or do something the next day, uh, the next morning, before when everything started up, that's when you said you'd say yes, sir, and that would be it. Uh, didn't uh, they didn't care what it was about or anything. You'd just say yes, sir, and that, and they they'd move on. So they knew who was going to be <coughs> uh, going to sick bay the next morning. And of course, Hathaway, he was in another billet, but we knew that he was hurting or something wrong. And he went, and uh, we just got some scuttlebutt after that. He never came back. Mm -hmm. uh, we got the scuttlebutt that, it, that they had, he had cracked the breastplate when he kicked him. Mm -hmm. And uh, that uh, Hathaway was all done. He was out. Uh, there was apparently a Navy doctor investigating it. All our medical care was covered by the Navy. Mm -hmm. uh, and then... It was approximately, I, I'm thinking around maybe two weeks later, uh, the drill instructor disappeared. And I, I saw him again uh, quite a bit later uh, when I was shipping, getting in my staging unit to go overseas. I saw him again and he was on his way. Mm -hmm. So I guess the broken breastplate was real, Hathaway's discharge was real, and... He had just gotten too mean, too yep. rough, and was told to go. That was okay. it. So. Now, were the other drill instructors a little more moderate than that fellow? Uh, yeah, they they weren't 
the extreme. All they never uh, let up on you, but that was the only physical. Mm -hmm. Well, we were all physically contacted. They were not to touch you, but that that's the rule. But who's around to watch and enforce? That never happened. I mean, they when they got up in front of you, they'd get right in your face and really start reaming you for something. If they looked both ways first, you knew it was coming. Mm -hmm. Uh, and usually it amounted to just a punch in the belly. <laughs> but even if you saw them do that, if you tightened up when he hit you, oh, then it really, things really got bad. So you just got, you got ready to know that when he, when, if he, if he'd gotten on to you about something, look both ways, you're going to get the wind knocked out of you. You might as well just get used to it because it's going to happen. <laughs> and you, and you don't. There's no way to get around it. All right. Now, did you have people who were serious disciplinary problems? A couple. Uh, a couple that thought they were harder than what those fellows were, the, the instructors mm -hmm. were. And there is nothing harder than a Marine Corps drill instructor. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what kind of training they go through. I often wanted to try to see if, uh, if there was some way to find out, but... Uh, they will not tell you to do anything that they can't do ten times better themselves. It's just, uh, and you're, if you butt heads with them, you're going to lose. That's mm -hmm. all there is to it. it just, right. And it took some fellows quite a while to get that idea through their head. A lot of times it took the rest of us as a platoon having a conference with the individual finally to tell him to quit doing this because it, every time something went on that he did wrong or, it, or was trying to get away with something, mm -hmm. When he had caught, the whole platoon had to do whatever for for the restitution, I guess you'd call it. All right. Uh, now, you mentioned that you wound up with two different platoons. How did that happen? Yeah. Uh, during the process of the training, in one week, you, you, you'll you either do guard duty around the San Diego uh, depot post, or you'll be on mess duty. Uh, my squad pulled mess duty. Uh, I was, we were, they were having spaghetti one night, one evening for the evening chow, and of course they do everything in just huge containers and stuff, and they had these, uh, bucket things with a, they had a bale on the top of it, and they pick it up like that. This was the sauce getting mm -hmm. dumped into this thing where the was sitting there throwing it on it for them. And they brought one up and put it right behind me. I was doing that part, and I didn't know it was there. And I turned around, and I fell back, and I arched my back over the thing, pulled something in my lower back, something popped, hurt. Oh, man, it felt like somebody ran a hot poker into me. And, of course, I'm all full of spaghetti sauce from having sat in it. And uh, they they shipped me over to a, the, the naval hospital area, the sick bay area, and they took x-rays and stuff like that and decided that I needed to take it easy for a couple of weeks. And I'm sitting there, how am I going to do that with what's going on? Because after this week of mess duty or uh, guard duty that you pulled, then you were going to the range mm -hmm. on Pendleton after that. Well, what happened was, of course, they just go on with the training and they, they took off the uh, 3081 and went to Pendleton and I had to stay there at uh, what they called the medical rehab platoon for two weeks. And that consisted of, and this is really bizarre, but they took me and they had me stand guard in the, what they called the motivational platoon barracks every night. And I'm, you know, this is supposed to be my recovery. So here I am standing in this huge doorway watching these 10 to 12 racks, bunks, with people in them that were those hardcore people that just wouldn't get with the program, which they had this special place for them called the Motivational Platoon. And they, I didn't have to do anything with that. It would just stand there at night, guard them at night. And, of course, I was given a nightstick and just told that if anybody runs at your neck and all this, you know, and I'm saying, how, how am I supposed to run after? I'm here for a back injury. <laughs> what am I doing? 
But I got a chance to watch how those people went through things. And like I said before, I had a pretty good idea what the, the whole Marine Corps thing was about as far as uh, the disciplinary end of it. But when I got done with that, uh, probably probably only a week and a half that I actually stood the duty, uh, I was thoroughly convinced then that the best thing to do was to get back in it, get going. It didn't matter if the back hurt or not. Let's just get out of here. So I was reassigned to uh, another platoon further in, uh, to another series mm -hmm. and wound up in 3089, and that's the one I graduated with. But uh, when I picked up with them, they were just on their way to the range, so I'm picking up right where I left off. Mm -hmm. uh, for the most part, most of all the, the instructors did the same uh, routine for the for uh, get, getting you through the 13 weeks, mm -hmm. I'm assuming, because it, when I got in with these guys, it was all new stuff coming up. It wasn't like, oh, oh okay, I've already done this mm -hmm. part or stuff like that. But uh, I, I, I think I went back with a fresher attitude. Um, the physical training portion of it, of course, they have what they, in order to graduate, they have what they call the CMC, it's Common Island Marine Corps Physical Readiness Test. And uh, I was, I did a lot better at everything there. Uh, I also found out as we went through that, that these, uh, of course, the drill instructors are rated on how well their group does as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, Not everyone, of course, can do everything at in a high degree. Uh, I could hold my own in most everything, but I excelled in, our, in the 30-foot rope climb and uh, sit-ups as far as repetitions per minute. I could, it was a phenomenal amount. I don't know how many I did. I just back and forth, you know, up and down real quick. So. When I when going through the CMT thing, of course they're they're tracking you. They have a lot of other uh, clerk type individuals that are out there, with, you know, doing the paperwork and stuff. So they don't know who anybody is anyway. And these drill instructors would, if they had a guy that was weak, uh, apparently we had two or three that were too weak on the rope climb because all of a sudden I, you know, started out on number eight and then I was number sixteen and then. Uh, you know, something like 33 or something like that. They, they just changed the number on my back and I was a different person to get ready. I'd go up the rope, slap it, come down and go over about six stations and then stand in line there. And when I got up, whatever number they'd given me, I'd just tell them the, the clerk and he'd mark it off that that person was going up and down the rope. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, somebody, he, he wasn't able to do it all the way through boot camp, but, but Nobody knew that because these guys were there just to check you that day for that thing. Yeah. And I guess all Marines look alike at that point anyway, right? Well, yeah, they, they don't, they don't know. And, yeah. Well, even if it was a black man filling for a white, they don't know. It's, <laughs> you know, what do they know? It's just number 18. Right. You know? it's just, uh, so I subbed for several people on the rope climb. I subbed for sit-ups. Uh, there was somebody had probably had to stub... For me, for some reason, a standing jump, I could not do it. And I still, to this day, can't. I can't just sit there, flex out, and then jump. It, I can't get off the ground more than that far. <laughs> and uh, so I'm certain, certain somebody covered for me there. And, and the same thing happened on the rifle range, which totally amazed me. And that's, I think that was my first uh, eye-opener to where I'm seeing... Uh, I'm starting to see there's a delusion here that, you know, they're not actually holding true to what they say. Because, yeah, everybody's going to be a rifleman, but some of them here are not earning it. Some of them aren't doing well. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I fortunately snapped in real good the first week and, and got everything going good. And uh, pre-qual day I qualified expert and then qualification day I did again. But uh, when I got, we, we, we fired at the 100 meter offhand, 300 meter, we did 
uh, repetition around uh, sitting and and kneeling. My sitting, I didn't have my position right, so that's where I, I knocked down. Out of, out of possible 225 points, I got 222. Mm -hmm. And I lost a couple of points on that on that sitting one. I rocked when I shouldn't have, and and I couldn't recover fast enough because it's a rapid fire thing. And I and I I don't know that I lost the points because I didn't fire all the rounds, or I don't think I don't think I missed, but I just mm -hmm. I couldn't get recovered to get my sight picture back fast enough. Anyway, but anyway, anyway, when I got back to the 500 meter line, all of a sudden I started becoming. Um, Private Allen, private, uh, uh, three three other people. I, I fired my series, and of course hit them all. That was not right on within my my ring and everything. The thing I was trying for, mm -hmm. and then they give me somebody else who's coming up, and and they, they hardly have points. And these guys, I'm just barely going to be. I've got to fire expert for them at the 500 in order for them to even qualify to make the basics. And I'm sitting there thinking, man, I don't know if I can keep doing this, and I, but I wound up doing it, and they were uh, quite grateful. I was I was a lot better received as a pickup in that platoon. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the platoons in boot camp, when you when they had a pickup like me, they were very much in doubt of them. They they and you never got close to anybody. You never. Mm -hmm. uh, Never really got accepted, but after that day at the range, that helped everything a lot. That just uh, because they all knew that I had been helping out with the firing and right. So, made, so uh, were they afraid that maybe you had been sort of held back because you screwed up or something? Yeah, so mm -hmm. you, you hold them down. Yeah, yeah, they come right out and say that uh, you know uh, we we don't have shit birds here and we don't mm -hmm. want any coming in. You know, it just. So yeah, yeah, and I understood the way they were saying it and everything, or what they were saying. But I thought at least you would give somebody the chance to see how they're doing. But then again, maybe that's the only time they felt that they had the chance to express their opinions. Right now, when you were doing the, the rifle training, were they still using M14s, or were you now on M14s? Yes, uh -huh. I used M14 all the way through. Uh, I never fired an M16 until just before I went into staging. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we and that was just kind of what they call a fam fire, familiarization firing. Right. With that. All right. Most of my shooting was done with the, well, all of it pretty mm -hmm. much done with the 14. All right. Uh, so you survive in the end. You get through your 13 weeks. Yeah. Okay. What do they do with you next? Head. We head to Pendleton, and they going to put you in what they call Infantry Training Regiment, mm -hmm. ITR. Uh, that, all of a sudden you become a company sized unit. Uh, you're, you become more aware of your position and everything. And that consisted of field exercises and training in, in the basic infantry maneuvers and stuff. Uh, uh, nothing really exceptional happened there till the very end of it when I was we were singled out by uh, of course having fired expert in boot camp that made me eligible for sniper training or I could go to recon school well in the process of going through ITR you, you start seeing different things taking place and we watch those uh, people in re recon school and all that was doing is running, hollering, you know, carrying heavy stuff and uh, going through a bunch of nonsense that you just wouldn't, didn't want to really get into. And I said, well, I'll opt for the sniper training then. Well, it turns out that's pretty much the same thing, but uh, but not, but it did concentrate more on the, on the weapon, uh, which at that point became a Remington 700. With, uh, Three by nine Redfield scope on it, and qualified with that at 600 meters prone position, which is a piece of cake with mm -hmm. anything like that. But uh, fired expert there, got my sniper rating. That took about 30 days at that, that training because that, that was also filled with. They called it Scout Sniper School. And what they did is they worked with you as a, you, you learned how to be a forward observer for 
um, calling in artillery, airstrikes, mm -hmm. things of that nature. You learn field first aid because you, if you were like in a field operating position, you had to take care of yourself. They mm -hmm. didn't send any Navy corpsmen with you then. Um, as a sniper, you wouldn't either because you would work on your own. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, your land navigation because there again, you're on your own. Uh, all the critical stuff that you would need to do to to effectively work by yourself. That's were you being trained by people who had done these jobs already? Yes, uh, I, I, that's one thing I was very fortunate with at the time that I went through it. We were they were getting some information back as to some of the conditions that were being faced in Vietnam and stuff like that, which would influence how you do things, and. They would, they would tell us right as we were going into something, okay, this is what we've been showing, but we found out this and this is to be true, so therefore we're approaching it this way. I mean, they would explain the difference in the two things so that, so that you could deal with the situation no matter how it came up. And I always felt that that was very fortunate. At least there's somebody else that's been out there to find out the things that you don't, don't already know, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the things. And... Gave you a, a distinct advantage, I think. Yeah. Had the instructors themselves actually been to Vietnam? Most of them, yeah. Mm -hmm. Most of them had. Uh, they, uh, some of them, you you kind of wanted if they were very like E eight E nines. Uh, you don't know what function they held mm -hmm. when they were there, but they had been you know overseas. But a lot of the coaches and stuff, to, you know, you'd have your main start to give you the stuff and then you'd go out and you'd try to do these things and they'd break you down in smaller groups and you'd have a coach and that would be like an E4 corporal or somebody mm -hmm. that had just been there or something. And, and he would also fill in a lot of information if you just listened to everything they were throwing out. It, uh, there was a treasure trove of information that you could take in and use. So as you're learning more about what actually happened in Vietnam and so forth, did you gain sort of more more confidence, or did you get more worried, or you definitely gain confidence. Yeah, you, you become so so attuned to the fact that you you start almost feeling like you're ten feet tall and bulletproof. You know, just uh, there's uh, I. It's hard to describe. I, I, it, it's a feeling that you know that there's a chance that anybody that you may not come back, but you never dwell on that. You never think about that to that extent. Uh, when you see a, a situation develop in the field, I mean, you, real quickly you can sort the odds of what's the best way to handle it. You know, is this a better chance of me getting nailed doing this or this? You know, and sometimes you're just picking the lesser of two evils, but uh, yeah, it, it was becoming more and more acutely aware of what you were going to be expected to do and how you were going to have to perform when, when things happened. All right. Now you get to the end of, of the sniper training. Uh, is the next stop Vietnam? Do you go home? Do you go to stage? Uh, I came back. I had a 30-day leave. I think it was in October of 69. I was back here. Uh, kind of antsy by the time the 30 days was up, I had long been ready to go back. Uh, it's, it's, I don't know, it's kind of a love-hate thing. I mean, you, all the time you're there, you're just thinking about, well, I'd like to get home, get out of here, get a leave, you know. But once you're on the leave, you say, eh, I'm ready to go back. <laughs> you know, just, was it hard to reconnect with people when you came home, or was there a very difference Very much now? so, yeah. very much so. Uh, it just so happened that there was another fella that had enlisted right after I had been drafted. And I ran into him in, uh, in ITR, or BITS, training, basic imagery training uh, school. I, was, I went to the mess off of Chow one time, because at that point you do everything independently. Mm -hmm. There's none of this hurting right. in and all right. that stuff. And I went there, and here, this fellow we knew, Doc, around the area here, he, he was there, and what are you doing here? And he started laughing. He said, oh, he says, you guys were all leaving. So he said, I thought I'd better do it. <laughs> and so I, I asked him what he did, his MOS was, and he said he was a machine gunner. 
Oh, wow. And then I, I didn't talk to him much after that, but when we got back, he had come back, too, about the, for the month of October for a leave, too, before staging mm -hmm. going overseas. So, but, uh, which was, him and I just pretty much hung around together the mm -hmm. whole 30 days. We just did stuff together and stuff. But, uh, All right. So you got go back again, and yeah. then, um, so they... they they give you some preparation prior to sending you over to Vietnam then? Yeah. Not really. At that point, your training is all there, all in place. The only thing, when I went back, I was put right back into the group of scout snipers mm -hmm. that had been trained. Right. And we were sitting, waiting. Uh, if you know the politics of the time, which uh, I know you don't want to get into much on that, but uh, Nixon was had was trying to institute what he was calling Vietnamization, training the Vietnamese to take over their mm -hmm. own responsibilities and stuff. So there was a little hesitation whether we were actually going to go anywhere or not, or whether there was going to be this this miraculous cutback and we'd be cut back before we ever got there and of course everybody's getting kind of antsy then because I mean we've gone through all this and as much as yeah it it, it we're heading for something hazardous we still wanted to go <laughs> you know it was, we've got all this invested now we're ready for it <laughs> so uh, there there was a probably a 20 day delay in everything which put us into Christmas and everything and I went uh, to visit my older brother, whom I hadn't seen since, uh, uh, when was that? I guess I was a freshman in high school. He was a sophomore. He quit school and joined the Navy. And he had been in since he had done that. And he was up in Vallejo, California, which is way outside the 500-mile limit they were giving us to <laughs> go on leave. And uh, But I went up there anyway. and. Uh, for, for Christmas and then got back in time, made formation the next mm -hmm. Monday morning. And, uh, but when I got back, made formation, and uh, there was our word when we were going to go. It was still two weeks off, but they had, it, had us all slated for going and everything. Mm -hmm. So we wound up, uh, I guess, started the process of heading out probably about the third, end of the second week, third week in January, something like that. Now, when did they fit in uh, the M16 practice? Was that uh, that was actually in the bits train and uh, basic infantry training and stuff uh, before I went to sniper school and stuff. Okay. I did get okay. familiar with that. Okay, so they had that there. Uh, yeah, we had a couple of maneuvers uh, where they did maneuvers where we went out overnight, and mm -hmm. uh, then they had a special range that uh, where everybody got online and just opened up all at once with everything, and they would do that uh, after dark. Uh, and uh, of course, we had every fifth round loaded as a tracer, and it was. I think. I think the guys just like to do the fire or the light show. Myself, <laughs> I mean, everybody went crazy, and and they would sit there. We'd pepper the daylights out of this one target area. Everybody's shooting at it from all directions, and all right. My buddy. Yeah. So did you in that twenty days or so while you're sitting around waiting? Did, did they have you do much? No, there was very little done. Uh, uh, there was no guard duty or anything. It was just you were strictly you. You get up in the morning, they'd make fall out on the road, and they'd take a count, make sure everybody was there, and then everybody would go to the bulletin board to see if anything had been posted yet. Mm -hmm. Nothing yet. Uh, go into town, you know, and do, just kind of monkey around. Right. Uh, okay, so when now a couple, couple of trips to Tijuana, you know, things like that. <laughs> So when you finally do go physically, then what do they do with you? The day comes, you're leaving. Uh, well, they just uh, they load us on a plane, and to be honest with you, I'm not sure whether we left from like uh, L.A. or whether it was like El Toro or where it was. I have no idea where it was where we went out. Did, of. Yeah. did they put you on a, on a chartered commercial flight or? Were you, yes, uh, okay. mm -hmm. it's a it's a really commercial aircraft. Uh, we flew, it was TWA if I remember right. I think they were still going in. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we went to Hawaii. Yeah, my stay in Hawaii, everybody asked me, what was Hawaii like? Well, I 
Well, no, I was only there an hour. Mm -hmm. <laughs> half an hour going over and half an hour coming back. <laughs> Again, just got off the plane while they refueled, right. got back on it, and then took the long grind, which is about 10, 11 hours to get to Okinawa. Mm -hmm. In Okinawa, stashed everything that we had as gear so far, uh, listed everything, packed it up in a in a sea bag, and uh, we were given, I guess, we just pretty much the clothing. We were given some gear there, but not a whole lot. Uh, when when, and then we flew from. And we, we stayed in Okinawa about four days, got enough time to get out outside the gate and into mm -hmm. town and get chased by shore patrol, do all that kind of stuff that you do mm -hmm. just before you're going over and uh, go all the places they tell you not to right. and everything. So, uh, uh, we shipped to Vietnam. Uh, Got, did they got did off they? the plane and herded into this building, a receiving building. Uh, building. Did you go to Da Nang or somewhere else? Da Nang, yeah. Flew into Da Nang and uh, we went in there and it was so reminiscent of the day in Detroit. Mm -hmm. They just started calling off names and sending people in different directions. Of course, we went as, uh, our group was as a sniper unit. There was a lot of others on the plane too, but our, our sniper group was getting split up. We were getting sent to all these different places. And again, everybody got called except me and this one other fellow sitting there. And then all of a sudden, they called our names. We go up, and he says, "Okay, you guys are going to go with first recon." And that was what I tried to avoid the training of mm -hmm. before. Now I'm in it. <laughs> okay, this is great. So uh, I did wind up being assigned to uh, first recon battalion mm -hmm. as a sniper. So. All right. Now, how did they get, where was First Recon at the time, or were they spread in a lot of places? Uh, it, was, uh, it was Camp Reasoner, uh, uh, called LZ-401. Uh, it was up in a mountainous ridge line to the west of Da Nang, mm -hmm. and it was at the base of the thing. Uh, I found out later that the reason for that was that uh, we we held the ridge, of course, and if anybody tried to rock it or anything, it'd just go right over you because you mm -hmm. were tucked up in this side. Right. So there was it was pretty secure area, uh, and it it consisted of uh, five com five combat companies of I'm thinking. Four platoons mm -hmm. and and a headquartered service company. And they're self-sufficient in all of their uh, supply, yeah. medical, all that kind of stuff. They, all the logistics that are needed to support the field. Mm -hmm. uh, they they all held their own in that battalion area. Right. How did they get you to the battalion area? One of those cattle cars again. Okay. <laughs> they had one of those over there. So you, 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 so you oh no, I didn't. Honestly, I, no, it was a deuce and a half. I'm sorry, it was. Okay. Uh, back of an open uh, deuce and a half truck. But they just drive you out from Denae. Yep. Yeah. And that's and it's so bizarre because you, you don't know what to expect when you're you're going into a war zone. Well, when we got off the plane, they had this big line around where, where the plane parked, and they said, when you walk, walk outside that thing. And you know you're you're kind of expecting well if this is a war zone I mean when you get out they're going to be throwing you a rifle and getting you you know dragging you someplace mm -hmm. and everything and it's nothing like that I mean it's just like it, you're like a tourist coming mm -hmm. in you know just nothing nothing to that nature I mean we went to go down the road the guys in the truck they drive down the center of the road and they go like there's no tomorrow mm -hmm. and Lord help anything that steps out in front of them and the most people had learned over the years they've been there to get out of their way but they do that so somebody doesn't lob grenades at them and stuff mm -hmm. you know they just go like crazy every place they're going all right but i guess there wasn't too much worry about mines or booby traps in that stretch no no not at that point i think those roads were traveled so well mm -hmm. and uh the area itself right in there 
didn't get infiltrated that much uh, right. because they always kept a wide margin around the airfields, you know, pretty much. Right? Any, any. Yeah. All right. Uh, about how long do you think it took you to get out to the base? Or? Mm, about 20 minutes, maybe. Okay. 20 okay. Minutes. So it's yeah, really, yeah. still pretty close to Denang there. Just Half hour, yeah. Mm -hmm. Not, not very side. far inland of the first bridge line. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, now, did the base itself, did the base camp, did that have concertina wire and all of that kind of stuff? Or oh, yeah. yeah. It had a perimeter and everything that, uh, and, and guard bunkers and stuff all around it that uh, <laughs> they posted watches, you know, all the time around day and night. Uh, most of them came out of the headquarters service group, though, because they wanted us available for doing the combat patrols and stuff. So. All right. Now, what kind of reception do you get when you arrive? What happens when you show up? Surprisingly, everybody is very open, uh, guarded, but open. Uh, they uh, they want to know who you were, where you were from, and. Uh, Actually, you know, what, if you had a critical MOS, mm -hmm. uh, that was probably the three basic things everybody asked, and then they turned around and went about their business. Uh, you just, at that point, uh, we just, I started just watching everybody, watching what they were doing, how they were putting stuff together, how they, how they had their um, 782 gear, their web gear, and everything mm -hmm. put together, all you know, the combat mm -hmm. gear that you carry. Did you have a weapon at this point? Uh, no, I had to go to the armory and draw one. Though. Uh, it uh, probably, well, it was late afternoon when I got there and everything. Got assigned the rack and everything. Got, got drew some linens and stuff and got, got the area squared away. Yeah, then we went down and drew a weapon at that point. All right. Well, this tape is just a... All right. Now at this point in the story, we've gotten you out to the base camp for the 1st Reconnaissance Battalion, that's the 1st Marine Division, uh, outside of Da Nang. All right. Um, and you're there, you're looking around, and then let's see, are you attached to a particular platoon or squad now, or are you just getting oriented still? Yes. Well, when I first got there, uh, they assigned me to Delta Company. Uh, I believe it was the second platoon, and when I went into the hooch there. Uh, the uh, it consisted of I think ten or twelve cots that I'm thrown into little individual areas. Mm -hmm. uh, they pointed me toward a open one there, and I started setting up with my stuff, putting it somewhat away, if mm -hmm. you can call it that. Uh, it, was, it was difficult to set up your own uh, area right off because most of everything that was there prior had been taken out, you know, mm -hmm. just uh, didn't, you didn't ask why that was vacant. Uh, everybody just liked to assume fell rotated out and mm -hmm. went home, that was it. So uh, if there were any more th to it, that would come out later anyway, but uh, you, you certainly didn't ask. Mm -hmm. uh, the first day, like I see, was just getting to know everybody, getting to uh, walking around the, mm -hmm. the uh, battalion area, learning where everything was, of course, trying to find out where the mess hall was right away, and which wasn't very far from us. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, just generally getting oriented. We went down and we registered at the, the aid station, the battalion aid station, so that they had an idea of everybody who was there and everything. And uh, I guess it's a, I guess my medical records went there mm -hmm. too, you know, for them to uh, file away from while I was there. And the next day, uh, the new, new fellows, all of us that had come in in the last day or two, we're uh, taken down uh, to an area down below the hill where where we were staying and everything, and we were started on a, another session of field radio operating. Uh, uh, 
I guess they just wanted to make sure that everybody was on the same page when it came to all that. Of course, with my sniper training, I'd been through it so many times at that point that I, I pretty much, you know, grabbed up everything, knew what to do, got going on it and everything. I was, uh, uh, some of the other ones that had just gone through ITR and stuff, you know, they had seen the radio operator before, but they never mm -hmm. actually dealt with it. Well, we, we actually got on there, uh, called in fake fire missions and things like that, and, and show, we, we were showing them proper procedure uh, of how you encrypt your messages and all that stuff. Uh, uh, the the encryption coding process is really amazing how they can coordinate this uh, throughout the entire country with every branch of the military. Everybody's using the same thing that day. That, that to me has still been amazing. How how as messed up as some things could get in the military, how they could keep that in order every day. <laughs> It was phenomenal. But you were uh, actually sending encrypted messages rather than, or was that just using code words, or were you scrambling the alphabet? Okay. Uh, they had a little device that. Uh, All right. Well, later on, when it first started out, they. Boy, I don't remember just exactly how they went about it. There, there was a different way of encrypting it, though. When I when I first got there, mm -hmm. the method that I was using was one, and while I was there. I will say midway through the year that I was there, they changed the style to where they had this little, uh, like a wheel mm -hmm. type thing with letters, letter combinations and stuff, and then the legend underneath it that that you picked out, and there was a certain way you set the wheel each day, uh, but that was only identified by, you know, you know like they say, set alpha tango, so you mm -hmm. take the A and T and line them up or something like that, and then that would give you references to all the other letters and numbers and everything that you would need to send a message. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was a, it was easy to use when once I showed you how it worked right. and everything and just uh, we did that for probably four or five days and I did notice that once I got there like that weeks no longer were something you kept track of it was just every day. It was every day something else was going on. There was no Sunday. There was no break. Or, of course, they had uh, services. The chaplain mm -hmm. of the battalion and everything had services there for people who wished to attend them. But most of the time, there was something more to do. Something else you had to do to you know to, something else you wanted to do just to make sure that you were up on everything that was going on. So, uh, how long did it take for you to go out in the field? Uh, probably almost four weeks before I went out the first time. Uh, and then, of course, being the new guy, you get to hump secondary radio, uh, extra batteries for the primary radio. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you had to kind of set that up first and then try to figure out how you're going to get any of your stuff in there, like your gel and ammunition and all that stuff. But... But the, there was usually somebody there that would help you get it set up the first time and show you what would be the best thing to do. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, our military being as it was, uh, all our web gear was set up for magazines for an M14, and we were using, now using an M16. Mm -hmm. So we had to adapt the magazine pouches to, to hold, I think we held four, yeah, I think we could get four magazines and then one tucked up in the lid because they were so much smaller than the M14 magazine. Did the Army guys have better equipment or were you all using the same gear at that point? Well, anything new that was developed, usually the Army got it first. Uh, um, but I, from what I understand about them, uh, they're mainly responsible for a lot of the developments and stuff too. I mean, they're, they're the ones that they get all that stuff going mm -hmm. and and decide what's going to what's going to be needed and what isn't and then whatever spilled over we get. But, <laughs> right. Okay. So during those first four weeks when you're out there, were you essentially just doing different kinds of training, or um, did you have other duties? 
Uh, yeah, there, uh, I think I did pull a couple of bunker watches during that, that first month and everything, but once it actively started on patrols, all that stopped. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Because they wanted, we would go out anywhere from six to seven days, and like, uh, like I said, when we walked into the barracks, like I think it was, uh, I think there was ten racks in each barracks. And that team, though, would only operate with five to six people. So there was somebody different kind of subbing in just about mm -hmm. all the time. The only, the only common element was usually the squad leader and the primary radio man. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were on every time that team went out, and the rest of the guys would kind of alternate and change off now and then. Mm -hmm. So you were assigned to a platoon, but the platoon doesn't really operate as a platoon. Not, that no, not that many. That, that was too many for what we were doing. Okay. Do you remember the first time you went out? Oh, yeah. Can you tell that story? It's... It is so... You're on edge from the moment they tell you that you're going to go because you don't know if you got your stuff the way you need to have it if something goes wrong. You, you, and you're new at it. You just... You're just not certain. You keep checking it, you keep looking at it, you keep moving stuff around, you keep shuffling things, uh, put stuff on, you know, trying to feel the pinch points, trying to get and make it sure it's comfortable as it can be. Uh, all You're doing this all the way down that morning when you get up. They have you go, they, they, they usually, before they, send, they sent you out, you'd go to the, to the mess hall and uh, couldn't couldn't eat anything. Oh, didn't uh, you know your stomach was in knots? You know you didn't feel like eating, and uh, you had to travel light because we we needed to move and we needed to move fast when we were out. Uh, it was very evident to see two hours in my first patrol, why recon trained the way they did, why they ran everywhere, why they did it, because that's actually what you were doing. <laughs> I mean, you were just, you were trained to stay out of sight. Uh, we were to not make contact, you know, try to avoid contact at all points, try to, if we saw something, we'd try to move away from it, uh, not to get away from it, Totally, but mm -hmm. back where we could observe and figure out what was going on, what they were doing, and everything. Uh, the ideal thing was if they were in a in a specific area, then calling an artillery fire mission or an airstrike on them, and uh, then slide away and go look for somebody else over the next ridge line. Now, would you simply uh, walk out from your base, or did you take a helicopter? To oh, we flew. Or? Flew to most of them because a lot of it, like when I was telling you where I wound up in Laos a couple of times, we we were out looking for resupply routes, uh, the infamous Ho, Ho Chi Minh Trail, but we where that is is nobody's guess because it's all over. It, it was a very, very complex thing the way they did that, and it was amazing how they did it, just, uh, you know, with... Because you look at most of the things they do, and it looks like they're in a stone age, but yet it was very well coordinated, and they knew just what they could do and what they couldn't. Uh, just, uh, now on that first trip out, did you find anything? Uh, pretty much quiet the first time out. But they uh, also want you to get used to what's going on, so I think they, they would send you to an area, probably somebody had been in there recently and didn't find much going on either, but they, they wanted the new guys to, to try to get the feel of what, it, you know, what you're expected to do day in and day out, uh, uh, picking harbor sites, stuff like that, and watch how everything's being done, uh, actually, you know, to learn the ropes, mm -hmm. but it really wasn't that long, probably my third patrol, when things went askew from the moment we got in there, really. But uh, now on the ground, would you move around on trails where they had them, or would you stay in, in, in the bush? Or? It, it would depend on what your point man picked out. Mm -hmm. uh, if he felt secure enough to, to work a trail, uh, we would use them for a bit, but most, uh, a good share of the time we'd stay off 
like paralleling them, mm -hmm. trying to figure out where the trail was going without actually walking on it. Um, and that, there's a lot of considerations you got to make. Uh, that can be a lot noisier doing it that way. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, there are times when you have to get back to the trail just for the simple fact that you, you don't want to take a chance on being heard before you get where you're going. So. Yeah. And did you carry all of your food and water with you? Or? Yes. Mm -hmm. But the food for us is very simple. Uh, and sea rations, they have uh, different. The entree was mm -hmm. like a four ounce can, and they usually had a four ounce can of fruit in there, and small tin of pound cake. Uh, we would take stuff that did not need heat. You know, uh, anything that you could eat that that uh, you didn't need to warm it up at all. Uh, as my tour progressed, they started experimenting more with the dehydrated uh, packs of stuff, mm, right. where we'd carry one of those for each day, I mean, which was a lot lighter than carrying a bunch of canned goods and stuff. Mm. But uh, really didn't, uh, you, you would be surprised. Uh, your physical conditioning is such that you can go all day long, have a little can of peaches, and that's uh, that's fine in the evening. You know, and you just yeah. So what did you do with your garbage? Bury it. Okay, because you, you don't bury. want them to know you were there, yeah, and you don't want to carry empty cans with you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, an empty can makes a noise. Uh, you had to learn how to eat out of the can without tapping it with the spoon. You know, making mm -hmm. a hollow clunk or whatever. You know. Uh, being being what they now call stealthy was was the utmost. I mean, that's what you had to do. I mean, some some guys went overboard with it. I remember one fellow that uh, he was so noise conscious that he they said they told me he said, "Watch Randy. He won't turn his head. He'll just roll his eyes from side to side." he thinks it might make a noise if he turns his head. And I, well, that's going a little bit too extreme. Huh? I could see it if you didn't want somebody to see the motion of you turning your head, but not <laughs> noise-wise. I don't think that... <coughs> I don't know. Yeah. And so over the course of a week-long patrol, where you're going from kind of place to place, checking out different sites, uh, so you're constantly moving, or do you stay in one place for a couple of days to wait and see if something happens? or? Uh, on occasion, I would stay in a place for a short period of time and watch a certain thing as a sniper. Mm -hmm. I would sit there. Those, but that didn't happen, oh, maybe twice, I think, that it actually, where there's a lot of times I was along as a sniper carrying the sniper weapon and everything in the patrol, but never was utilized that mm -hmm. way. Uh, actually, we were, we were really to gather information. That's right. what they wanted right. more than anything else. So. so what was the purpose of sending a sniper along with them then? I imagine, well, most of the time I was told that we were looking for an individual. Uh, they had so-called intelligence, <laughs> which is a loaded phrase that a uh, certain uh, NVA officer or something might be in a certain area mm -hmm. and we might be on in that area or on the edges of it and we would keep an eye out and if the opportunity arose we would try to engage if it was practical. Mm -hmm. It was always up to the, the, the squad leader whether I would do that or not. He, he made the final decision whether we take a chance on compromising our position by taking the shot or not. Mm -hmm. So it uh, sometimes it, they had something specific in mind. And sometimes it, there was a couple of times where they just said, yeah, just target of opportunity if you feel that you can take it, take it. Yeah. yeah. Now, did they give you an M16 or a carbine or a pistol in addition to your uh, sniper rifle? Or was that no, one? I just carried the, the, the rifle itself. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of ammunition. But uh, it would only hold five rounds at a time, so mm -hmm. it was a bold action. Right. But, but the other ones that, the only time that I would actually need to do that, it would be just a single shot anyway, usually. Mm -hmm. So, 
and the other ones were all in very strategically placed before I chose to, you know, take a shot or right. anything. They, they were all in and, and ready for it, knew mm -hmm. that the noise was going to be made, and they just watched their each their own respective zones. And okay. Now you said the first couple of patrols are pretty quiet, and then things got more complicated on the third one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, secondary radio on that when I was carrying an M16, and we wound up walking right into the middle of a base camp and not realizing it until we were in it. And we walked, or we just started crawling the trail down in the draw. Uh, I can remember looking up and seeing these, uh, this fresh dirt around these bunkers and stuff built into the ridge line and everything further up. Uh, but it's kind of like, well, it appears that the lights are on, but nobody's home because there was just nobody there. And we just crept through very slowly. Uh, finally got out the other side of everything. Started feeling a bit more relaxed as we moved away from it. We plotted it all. Uh, prepared to call a fire mission on it. And while we're sitting there waiting for uh, the uh, squad leader and radio man to do their their thing of getting everything called in, we hear a couple of voices coming down, these two walking down the trail, jabbering like crazy. And so they had no idea anybody was in the neighborhood or that we were around. The, uh, <laughs> our, our platoon sergeant, he liked to mess with this one guy all the time and he says, he says, let's grab a prisoner and this guy was really getting short that's way and he, he was always saying let's do something bizarre just to get him get him going you know and he was going oh no 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 and I thought they were going to grab one They're, they were kind of moving like that's what they were going to do and I started off I well somebody needs to be blocking behind here if they're going to do that and all of a sudden everybody's whispering attention and, you know, come on back. And so I came back and I, and I looked and I said, I thought you were going to do this. Well, as it turns out, they, uh, I don't know if they heard us or if they saw movement or what the deal was, but all of a sudden it started getting mighty active around. We were seeing different things happening in different locations, you know, and it looked like we were, they were trying to flank us or something. We weren't certain if they knew we were there, but we figured something was up. So we waited and waited, and uh, it started, it was getting close to getting dark. And how did he do that? He just, I guess he finally, uh, the, the platoon sergeant finally called in and said that the, he wanted to get extracted if it was at all possible, but there was no place for a chopper to sit down. We'd have to be, say, right where we are but it's totally open overhead for a ladder extract. And that's when I got my first ride on a ladder when we left there. Of course, uh, on the way up, we took some fire from these characters all around, and I was able to get off a couple of rounds, and I think they must have been well placed because all of a sudden we weren't getting the fire from the one spot anymore. Mm -hmm. so. But I don't know if, if we hit anything or not. It's just how long. But it was take? freaky because that that takes a long time to go up. Yeah, seems like eternity. Now, did men go up? Did you have to go up one at a time, or are you all climbing up after each other? Same now they come in. They the thing is rolled up on the tailgate of the CH forty six, and they they come in at a hovering height and they just dump it out and it hits the ground. And you take it, would try to unroll it, get it, get it out, and then they start they start slowly rising until they get enough land on the ground to take care of how many of you are going to get on, so that you're on the bottom end of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, two guys hooked up, and I hooked up behind them, and then the last two guys came on, 
uh, as as they're picking it up. But as soon as those last two are on, then they're they're lifting them, and then they're going up. But uh, I have nothing but the most admiration and respect for those pilots. They just sit there stone still, not mm -hmm. perfect targets for anybody. Mm -hmm. Just messing around, and you know, with them, they can they can create havoc with them. But those guys, they do it. They're they're disciplined enough to stay right in one position like that. And uh, <laughs> and wait while you while you're fumbling around with this stuff. Trying, we we're already rigged for hooking on to this mm -hmm. if we have to. Uh, that goes on first before your other gear. So it's just a question of getting the D ring out visible and clipping it mm -hmm. on. But how long do you think the physical process took from the time the helicopter comes down to the time you're going away? At least four minutes, if okay. not more. And which may not seem like much to some people, but that's an eternity for that guy to be sitting there like that, just hovering. If there's guys around in the area with AK forty sevens, then yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> But uh, they also had a, well, they, they've got their gunners on board mm -hmm. up there, and they were peppering the area to help keep things. Uh, a 50 caliber has a way of keeping their heads down, mm -hmm. and it keeps them down on the ground. And, uh, just the sheer noise of them going off. <laughs> Did anybody get hit on that, of your guys? No. Mm -hmm. okay. no uh, we got out, and... Uh, like I say, I'm not sure if anybody got hit on the other side either. I'd say it was, uh, mm -hmm. it was trying to get out of there without having something go really wrong, you know. But uh, when we were first getting, when they were, when we call it being probed, when they mm -hmm. were trying to check out, trying to figure out where we were just exactly, uh, that my first thought when he said ladder extract, I mean, man, we don't want this guy hovering over us, you know, and not only dangerous for him, but then they know where you are, you're right underneath <laughs> it, you know, <laughs> just, but that's what they did and that's how it worked. And it worked, all right. Uh, now, now, how long uh, did you stay with that unit? With the unit? Your, with your platoon, with, with, with the reconnaissance battalion, was that both your full oh, tour? Oh, my, my full tour was spent there. Uh, okay. I, like I say, I started out with uh, Delta Company. Mm -hmm. uh, somewhere along, around about September of 70, again with the, the political climate the way it was, they were supposedly withdrawing troops from Vietnam at a high rate. Well, that's kind of a loaded thing. What they took was that our, our five combat companies and which were several teams that were had the basics to operate. Mm -hmm. They built two companies reinforced with all people out of those areas that still had time to do mm -hmm. overseas and everything. Others that were close to rotation dates and stuff they and H&S Battalion and what they call the Colors rotated back to the States. Back here you heard that a battalion mm -hmm. was withdrawn. They weren't. We were still there. Mm -hmm. It was actually two fortified companies that were left. And I'm imagining that there's a lot of that still takes place now. I listened to the State of the Union address mm -hmm. last night and I and he said, we have no more troops fighting in Iraq, yeah. which means there's still, still plenty there. Doing something. Yeah. They're, they're probably still in hazardous situations, but uh, they're there. All right. Okay. Now, uh, go back into where you were. You had your, th your third patrol, things start to happen. Did you get, at times, in, into actual firefights of any size, or did you make uh, Yeah, there are several times we've had, we were into some skirmishes and stuff that uh, long about mid-July, that was my birthday, as a matter of fact. We were doing one of those forays up into Laos. And uh, from the time we set in, uh, they knew we were there. And it was a constant run and uh, constant moving fast, moving quickly, uh, trying to move away from, uh, get away from the LZs so that they wouldn't congregate to mm -hmm. open areas to think that that's where we were going to get picked out, but yet we knew within a few hours that 
uh, this patrol wasn't going to last no six, seven days. Yeah. Uh, so we just kept, we pack up, we move, and uh, we kept moving at a steady pace, and we'd wind up finding more and more of them. Uh, the old expression, the woods is full of them, <laughs> and they were, it was, they were everywhere. But they ran us, and it was, it was just before my 21st birthday uh, that uh, I didn't know if I was going to see it or not there for a while, because it was run, 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 and I'll bet you for three days we ran steady until we finally got to an area where they could pick us out. And... That was that was our first exposure, I think, to the uh, helicopter squadron called the Purple Foxes, and those guys were good, boy. I mean, those guys came in and they that that helicopter bounced when it hit the ground with the gate down and everything, and we were right into it, and he was gone again. I mean, he just. Uh, to come in like that because we didn't know what he was going to be facing and of course they came in blazing everything around because we knew we had movement everywhere mm -hmm. and uh, and of course he has two Cobra gunships flying support so as soon as they figure out which one of the trans there's two transports mm -hmm. two 46s as soon as the first one came in uh, the other one he orbits over away from things a little bit mm -hmm. and those over gunships start ripping the daylights out of stuff around it and uh, and like I say he hit the ground hard and we jumped in and we were gone that was probably the quickest extract that was ever on that and it, it's amazing how fast it can happen now, had you so, found a natural clearing to use or was there yeah mm -hmm. yeah that was one that that the uh, we scoped it you know, from the maps, what mm -hmm. looked like it is, and then we'd, we'd try heading for it and try to see if we could get up high to get a look at it first. Uh, and sometimes we'd come to one and nah, it, wasn't, it mm -hmm. wasn't good for it because of the way everything, the way the terrain was laying. Right. So we, we, over that three days, we, we scoped out six or eight different places that would, would, could have gotten us out, but... Uh, we spent the night uh, sleeping in shifts. Uh, was there? there were six of us, so there was two guys awake all the time. We made sure there was two guys mm -hmm. up watching or listening. Uh, got probed the second night at our harbor site, but we didn't want to move in the dark, so we just we just kind of made believe we weren't there, you know, which was. That was freaky because anybody expected a grenade to land right in the middle of us at any point. Because when we harbor up or where we can touch, mm -hmm. everybody can touch somebody else. Right. Uh, there's no spreading out. No. So they're just they're just kind of feeling for you in, in the dark, pretty much, literally. And yeah, if they're doing that, but they're, they're making so much noise, you know they're there, and they know you know they're there, <laughs> and. I, I'm I'm assuming what they were trying to do, like sweep the ridge line mm -hmm. to, to see if they could stir anything, right. get anything right. going. Yeah. Okay. Now, when you had a patrol like that, where you're, they know you're there right away, are you able to accomplish anything useful, or are you just kind of distracted? Not really, yeah. because you you don't want to wait to have them get close enough, you know, to try to identify what uniform markings or anything right. like that. I mean. And whatever they have going on, whatever they were doing, you wouldn't know what it is anyway because they've stopped doing it to right. chase you. So right. Now, did you have patrols where you kind of were able to detect something significant? I mean, you found the bunker complex or whatever that first time. Would you ever spot convoys or movements? No, never, never knew, knew of a convoy. We could hear it, but for some reason we never found it. Uh, by the time we got worked around... We could hear engines running, so we knew something mm -hmm. was happening over there, someplace off. But uh, by the time we got over in that area, there was nothing around. There was no evidence of anything. Uh, it does make you wonder, though, if you're being the one checked out mm -hmm. in those situations because you came in 
after it and you know they were there uh, but you don't see anything so <laughs> just all right uh, how many of these patrols do you think you ran I think I My such or my record says I was on twenty eight oh, range ones. All right, now you lose count, you know yourself, and just now did you did your squad take casualties in any of these? No, never. We never took a casualty all the time. Uh, our sister platoon, a couple of them did. Well, as a matter of fact, in November of seventy, we lost an uh, entire fire team to. Uh, an extraction accident. Mm -hmm. They picked them up on a ladder and took off and flew right into a mountainside with them. And then that, for the next all oh, six, eight days, it was a uh, team, we would go out and try to get into the area. But the thing that happened was it was weather. They were socked mm -hmm. in and, uh, and, they, and they flew into that ridge line. Of course, the ladder tangled and mm -hmm. just pulled the chopper right down. But uh, the weather was the big hamper of getting somebody else in there, and there were two of, two of our teams that were uh, we were prepped to to go to see if we could find them and and eventually get them all out. And uh, every you know they were all sure they went down and that there was no survivors or, but uh, you can't be certain mm -hmm. you know it could be just all radio equipment was damaged and nothing could be called out. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, the guys in the next hooch over from us were the ones that actually found them. Mm -hmm. And uh, we flew in a chase bird just in case, you know, if they were trying to do the thing of mm -hmm. getting things picked up and squared away, uh, we were there if we had to set in to mm -hmm. maybe make a bigger perimeter right. or something like that. But we never went on the ground. We, uh, uh, what did you, did you um, encounter, did you find things on the ground at different points that, that may have provided useful intelligence I mean, after that? Oh yeah, time? yeah. Uh, we, were, we had uh, like a black and white camera that we took with us. They, they always wanted us, our photographs in black and white. Mm -hmm. If somebody else had their own camera and took it in color, they, nobody wanted the film out of that. They, those uh, intelligence people apparently were just trained in, in picking things out in black mm -hmm. and white pictures and that's what they wanted. Uh, but we would take pictures of different things and, and, and get it back to them. And what they ever did with it, we don't know, you know. I can almost say that I don't think I ever... Well, I know I was near the same place a couple of times, but we never got set in in the same place mm -hmm. twice. And, just, and I can't say somebody else wasn't there ahead of us, but, uh, you know. Because there was a couple of times, like I thought, you know, I, I, or I felt that somebody had been there before us, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, did you ever actually see uh, any North Vietnamese troops when you were out on these patrols? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we've seen them from a distance. I know close enough where we could try the airstrikes and stuff on them. Mm -hmm. But uh, we never had, never were told to go in and do a, a BDA afterwards. So. Mm -hmm. You know, we were pretty much prepared to do it, but uh, you also be surprised how much stuff can rip up, tear up, and everything else, and and the amount of firepower they can put into an area, and then you'll sit there and watch, and all of a sudden you'll see somebody moving around again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you say, now how did they come out of that? <laughs> all right. Now, over the course of, of the year here, do you have a lot of personnel turnover, just guys rotating out of the unit? Yeah, it, it, it's fairly steady, but, uh, well, between that and that restructuring right. that took place in September, uh, I actually finished up a whole bunch of different guys different than what I started with. Mm -hmm. There was nobody left over. Those other right. individuals had either rotated back or wound up in the in one of the other fire teams or something like that, because mm -hmm. uh, uh, Delta Company just got totally broken up. Uh, they went in different directions. But. Okay. Now, as uh, the actual sniper, did you ever actually 
do a job or have the opportunity to do one. You were sent out a couple of times that way. Yes, I did, but not as a result of a patrol. Okay. I, we also had a hill that we maintained south of Da Nang. Uh, First Recon would provide the security for the, what they call the NOD team, Night Observation Device. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a big mounted starlight scope. It was back in the early days of them when they were big and bulky and awkward. And these guys watched over what they called uh, the Indian Territories uh, on this last ridge line. If you follow the ridge lines back and moved up into the Quezon Mountains, well, I'd go up in there sometimes when we were out there providing security, I would go out for a day or two mm -hmm. sometimes that way. But, uh, so that was just looking for enemy movement closer to your bases there? Yeah, you were trying to find some, the thing is there's movement everywhere because people live down there. Mm -hmm. And trying to pick out something that is actually a military target is hard to do. And I had some mixed emotions about the whole situation because one of the first times that I went up on the hill, I had checked out the a sniper rifle to go and uh, our, the lieutenant that was heading it up when we went up there said he wanted to try to fire the weapon and I hadn't sighted it in or anything. Uh, I just got it checked out. So I thought, well, it's uh, I can probably get at least get it in the ballpark here. There's people down below the bottom of the hill, and what what we were told was a, supposedly our free fire zone. And uh, he aimed. He aimed down there at something. Fired. I had a spotter scope, and I was right beside him. And I saw where the round hit, and I said. Uh, I just, I said, you know what you, what you were aiming at. He says, he said, well, he said he didn't see the round hit. So, I said, I got a rough idea what this dark clump that he was pointing at. Uh, so, I commenced walking the round into it by doing a little reverse mm -hmm. thing of the adjustments. And about the fourth shot, these, these three people were out there and they, and they kept, they were waving, but then they were squatting down like they were doing something and we didn't know whether, we'd had patrols go off the hill before and walk into booby traps mm -hmm. and stuff and so we had no idea what actually they were doing. And he was trying to fire some warning shots to get him out of there, to get him to move away from that area. Uh, I thought he was after him. So he he kept firing and I and I watched where the round would go. And I don't know how many rounds he actually fired, maybe maybe six altogether. Or the, well, the six one the last one. Uh, I moved it. I moved it over. I just kept time for you to keep aiming at the same point that you're aiming at. Mm -hmm. it actually, it doesn't make any difference where that is. You can get it to do what you want it to do. And uh, so I moved it over, left a couple down, and he got one of them. Uh, it turned out to be a, a woman in the group. And he killed her, and uh, he uh, when when he when it hit when it hit, I was watching the spider scope, and I says, "Got one." And he just looked at me. And he says, "I wasn't trying to hit anyone." And I'm sitting. It's just like somebody pulled a rug out from under me. Mm -hmm. This is very early in my tour, and mm -hmm. it, uh, and I'm sitting there thinking, with all this training people have been giving me and everything. And I can actually apply it well enough to where I don't even have to pull the trigger and I can do it. Mm -hmm. And now this isn't right, you know, this is wrong. What is, what's going on? Well, <coughs> as it turned out that uh, there were some uh, Arvin regulars up there on the hill that turned it in 
and uh, of course, and then there was a trial and all that stuff, and I think in July and August, and had to go into a military court and all mm -hmm. that stuff. And uh, he was acquitted of it because it, you know he was actually he was. Uh, he was able to convince them that that's not what he was doing, that he wasn't doing that. But he was the type of officer that he would not tell them that I was adjusting that site. Mm -hmm. That he just kept insisting that it was, it was just something freaky that happened. It wasn't planned. It wasn't supposed mm -hmm. to be. And uh, when they called me, they the his defense team tried to get me to say, to tell what I was doing while I was spotting it and everything. Because I just, we had just established that I was spotting the rounds. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize that at the time what they were trying to, the one attorney was trying to get me to say was that I was adjusting the scope crosshairs. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never quite said that. I just, uh, you know, I, we'd make some adjustments and then he'd shoot again and blah, blah, blah. And he wound up, like I say, being acquitted, but I found out afterward that that's what they had wanted me to say was that I was changing that. And he wouldn't, he didn't want that to be said. Because every time they, they would ask me, either the prosecution or the defense asked me a question, I'd look at him. And he would either, you know, like he'd nod, you know, if he wanted me to go ahead with it or not. And we we worked it out, you know. And we never lied. We never told him anything that wasn't so. But uh, it it was hard on me mm -hmm. because I, I felt I was doing what I was sent there to do. Right. And now all of a sudden I'm being told, no, that's not right. And it and it's like this thing of well you just keep going until you're going when we find you doing something wrong then we're gonna grab you on it and I'm like come on you know why not spell this stuff out ahead of time why not tell everybody what's expected you know because yeah. if he had told you what his purpose was to start with yeah yeah that's true uh, yeah if he had told me okay all we're gonna do is try to get him out of there uh, fine I I probably wouldn't even adjust it I'd just let him shoot because it was going mm -hmm. wacky anyway. Um, there was a sergeant on the hill at the time that uh, called me uh, bloodthirsty, uh, kind of demonized me to everybody else. And I think there was a, a good share of them that uh, had a, kind of like a mistrust in me over mm -hmm. the whole deal. And that made parts of the two are hard. I mean, I still, when I went out on patrol with them and everything, I strictly business and I dealt with things in a, in a professional manner and everything, but I always kind of wondered in the back of my mind whether if if chips were really down, would, how would it work out? Mm -hmm. So that made you a little more isolated than you, you might have been otherwise. Yeah, definitely. Even out of your own squad at that point. Yeah. Right. All right. Um, now, over the course of uh, the year that you're there, do the missions stay essentially the same? Do you just keep doing the same kind of thing in the same general areas, or are there changes as you get farther into it? Uh, toward the end of the tour, after after they had restructured the area, the battalion, and everything, uh, we worked closer into population centers. All of a sudden we weren't going way off out into mm -hmm. Never Never Land, uh, mainly the Quezon Mountain Range, the western Quezon Mountain Range uh, near Anahua. Uh Worked that a lot uh, toward the end of my tour. And I'm, I'm guessing at this point of the way everything wound up going was that they had moved in those resupply things we saw going on and everything were actually fortifying the Quezon Mountains, but we weren't we weren't getting them coming in. We just, they were just coming in from so many directions you couldn't get them all, and it was so sporadic you didn't know when they were going to move stuff. And uh, uh, I don't know. I I, I it, it different but same. 
Uh, once we got to the quayside, I mean, we'd get put in maybe by a chopper, but then we would walk around and we'd wind up linking up with some of the Fifth Marines or somebody, mm -hmm. the, the grunt outfits that had a ridge line or something occupied. We would walk in, resupply, walk out again, and go see if we could roust out some more things, you know. And would you start encountering civilians or people sometimes as you were patrolling, or...? Uh, no. Actually, we saw very few individuals at that point. We would see them down below in the valley and stuff, mm -hmm. but as far as being up there in the mountains, they weren't. We knew they were hiding in there somewhere, but our group never found any. All right. Now, over the course of, of that year, did you get any RR time? Any... Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think, maybe in September we went? September, October. Yeah, I think it was in September because I think that's when they actually divided and mm -hmm. everybody moved because when we got back, we couldn't, our hooch was empty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they moved all their stuff over to another one. So, yeah. Did you get in-country R&R or was this out of the country? No, this is out of the country. This was in Thai, Taiwan, Taipei. Mm -hmm. uh, spent seven days there. A beautiful country, really nice. People, the, the free Chinese are just... Fantastic people, and just really amazing. Uh, now, did you pick Taiwan, or was that just what was available at the time? It was what was available when we came back. Uh, it was always known that when when the the rides came in, if you were out in the field, you, all the, the office pogs and everything got Australia and stuff mm -hmm. like that, you know. Uh, and for some reason, I didn't want to go anywhere near Bangkok, Thailand. I I didn't. I don't know. I just it never sounded that interesting mm -hmm. to me. But Taipei, now that that was different. That, that that's something different. And had a, I had a very good time when I was there. Uh, had a young lady that they link you up with right away if you like them. And she was very very intelligent individual. Cause I can remember I. I drew everything I had on the books as far as pay when I went, and I don't know, something like $750, which back then was quite a chunk, mm -hmm. and she just looked at me, she says, you trust me? I said, okay. She says, okay, give me the money, and then she just, when, at the end of my seven days, it was mm -hmm. gone, which mm -hmm. I knew was going to happen, but she, she had a whole itinerary set up and figured out different things to do, places mm -hmm. to go. Uh, scenery things to see. She took me up in the mountains into a, a mountain resort that was just fantastic. Mm -hmm. so, uh, had to take a cable car to get to it. You know, it was uh, it was nice. It was fun. Yes, what was it like uh, being out of Vietnam for that week in a place where there was no, nothing to worry about for people shooting at you or anything else? You still worry about it. You still you're constantly checking around you. Uh, it's because you're still, especially in Taipei, you're still in a, a land of short oriental people that mm -hmm. you don't know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> all right. Now, did you have much contact at all with any of the Vietnamese people, either working on the base or...? Yeah, there were some that came and went uh, each day that did uh, some duties um, in Camp Reasoner. And when I was there, the time... Mm -hmm. cause for the most part, I was pretty much gone a lot, yeah. uh, and when I was back, I was either sleeping, grabbing some chow, or uh, getting my gear together and cleaned up and squared away for the next thing, because we never knew when it was coming, when mm -hmm. what was coming up or when. But, uh, so you could see them kind of around. You, you, you weren't going in, into the town anywhere, or villages, or things like that. Uh, -uh. we we didn't do that much. Uh, Hill three twenty seven, the the big PX here in Da Nang, was just up the road from us, and I think we went there twice. We we some of they somebody made arrangements for a six by, and a bunch of us went down, mm -hmm. and uh, we'd go down, and then I he, the driver would wait for us to get finished with getting whatever they were going to get and everything, and we'd come back again and. Uh, it's kind of like kick a you know kick back time going to the store right here you know and just was there tension between the guys who went out on patrol and the guys who stayed on the base? 
Not really. Not really, because everybody there had a job to do, mm -hmm. and how well they did their job made a difference on how well you could do yours. Uh, I heard a statistic once that, that there was, uh, for every guy in the field, there was like 10 that it took 10 to 12 mm -hmm. that it took to support right. that. And I would believe that because mm -hmm. there was an awful lot of people that went to Vietnam and actually it's a relatively small portion that were actually the combat mm -hmm. people that actually were, mm -hmm. you know, out doing the fighting and stuff. So Now in general, were the people in your battalion doing their jobs? And was the job yes. getting, done, getting done right? Yes, yes, very much so. Very professional, very good. Uh, Always ready to answer something, uh, answer a question that you have. Uh, I know I see movies and stuff portray, uh, uh, you know, somebody asking something and, and somebody being, you know, rude, mm -hmm. get away from me, new guy, and all that mm -hmm. stuff. I never saw any of that take place. That uh, they were. Uh, the everybody seemed to be more than willing to answer a question you had or to help you. Mm -hmm. Do some do something that was going to be something be involved in your patrol or something right. like that. They were very eager to help. Right. Uh, did you let's see? Were all of the men in, in your squad white, or were there any any black or Hispanic? Yeah, there there were some there were some black guys, a lot of Hispanic fellows. Uh, but you know, I, I I'm trying to think. Uh, one black guy got he got hurt one time and they got shot out. It was another group, and he just picked up a piece of shrapnel in his eye. Uh, but he was the racial tensions that they were talking about. We didn't seem to have. Mm -hmm. There were. Well, I'm not sure how many they're in the, you know, the ones that were there, they did their job, they knew mm -hmm. their job, they were eager to help you if you needed help. Mm -hmm. uh, they wanted to be able to depend on you, and of course you wanted to be able to depend on them, mm -hmm. and we didn't have that rub, it just didn't seem to be there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Another uh, standard kind of thing that, that comes up, people talk about, about drug use and alcohol use and things like that. When you're back on the base, were there people who were smoking pot or drinking too much beer or whatever? When I first got there, there was a young fellow there that uh, was into, they told me it was speed. It was mm -hmm. in like a clear liquid in a bottle that he, and he was high all the time. He was never utilized in any kind of a combat situation, never did any guard duty. Mm -hmm. What it looked to me like was he was a professional malingerer, mm -hmm. and everybody knew it, but rather than even mess with him, they just avoided him, stayed mm -hmm. away from him. As far as drug use, I'm sure there was some as far as the marijuana and stuff mm -hmm. went. I didn't deal with it. Uh, nobody in our hooch that I know of dealt with it. If they did, they went somewhere else mm -hmm. to do it. You know, it just... It, 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 it certainly isn't like Apocalypse Now indicated. Yeah. 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 <laughs> certainly that, that, not yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there are, you know... There's a fair amount of information on stuff that went on at rear area bases and things like that, uh, and some incidents reported in, in the field, but it's the kind of thing where uh, it's going to depend on, on where you were. And in your case, because you're, you're there relatively late, and on the whole, most of the kind of stereotyped morale problems are not really showing through very much yeah. in, in what you experienced, and that's important to be, to be aware of. But we, uh, the unit that I belong to is very very good and tight knit, even though may not all work together all the time. Mm -hmm. One example of, of how everybody did their job so professionally, if any any time a fire team got shut out, like any time of the night or whatever, and got brought back, that guy in charge of the mess hall had his whole crew there, ready to go, and hot child ready for them when they come back mm -hmm. in. 
And nobody told him to do it. It wasn't anything they insisted on. He just did it. Mm -hmm. And none of his guys complained to him. You know, they may have just gotten in the wreck an hour earlier. But boom, they were right back up. And, you know, the fire team coming in needs, they want, they want supper, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just, and he'd get, like I say, he'd get up in the middle of the night and fire up the whole mess hall after they'd cleaned it all up and put it in bed. Just, now, during that, remarkable. Year, your year over there. How much contact did you have with home? Were you writing to anybody or hearing from anyone? Or I wrote to my folks on occasion, yeah. Uh, it was very hard because of what we were doing. Mm -hmm. You couldn't say a lot about what was going on. Uh, one time I got to call home. Uh, it was just there was a system they had set up through the, the field phone in the in our company office and through a radio series of um, mm -hmm. ham operators, yeah, I yeah. guess, relayed it. Yeah, you, you'd just speak to them. You, you had to talk on there like you did on the radio, which was trying to hard, kind of hard for your folks because they didn't understand what why they had to say over every time they finished saying something. But <laughs> everybody in there had to flip the switch the other way, you know. And... Uh, and uh, that's when I called home and found out that the that outfit my dad worked for right over here in Sogatuck had eliminated all its semis and he was mm -hmm. out of work and I'm so I'm trying to find out if they if they want me to reroute my pay home you know because mm -hmm. I'm just putting it on the books anyway it doesn't matter I can, if they can use it but uh, they, there was no problem there they didn't want that and uh, by the time I rotated back and came home and everything, he well established in something else. I mean, he was, he was able to find another job and back to work easy enough. But, uh, now, over the course of the year, did you have any, any physical problems? I mean, you're out there and stomping around in the jungle and so forth. Did that physically wear you down or did you get any of the kind of chronic things people could pick up? I had a bout of jungle rot across my lower back where my gear kept rubbing all the time. Uh, it irritated it and then would constantly open up. I'd always have to, I'd go down to the uh, senior corpsman that was, he was actually assigned to one of the one of the fire teams, but he would take me over to the aid station and they would bandage that all up before I got ready to go out. and. Cover, covered up real good and everything, but uh, of course when you get out there walking, sweating and everything, that, that eventually came off, but mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, it it helped it through the first parts of it anyway like that. Uh, not really anything other than that. Uh, they started it out when I first got there, they were giving you malaria pills mm -hmm. and salt pills and then all of a sudden they stopped that. I don't know what the deal was with that. But uh, I don't know weren't, weren't the salt pills kind of important if you're out there and sweating a lot out in the field? Or well, that was the thought uh, originally when I first when we were first taking them. But for some reason, the philosophy on it changed. They didn't push the salt pills anymore. They just it's weird. I, I don't know. I don't know what changed on it or why why it was different. All right, that is going to finish. All right, we're kind of getting here toward the kind of closing out the stuff in the tour. Uh, one other question: uh, Did you have, did you pay much attention to any to news coming from home? I mean, nineteen seventy is a period you had Kent State going. You had you had a lot of different things going on. Were you paying attention to that, or were you really just kind of focused on your own world and where you are right there? Uh, we heard about Kent State from guy coming in who happened to uh, have gone to Penn State mm -hmm. and uh, he, he brought the information with him when he came and joined up in our group. Uh, we not I don't ever recall hearing anything about it on AFVN or anything mm -hmm. like that but I very seldom listened to that too. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I did not know that 
we had almost lost the astronauts on Apollo 13 mm -hmm. until 1974. And I just happened to hear the story somewhere, mm -hmm. and, I, and I had to go dig about it. I had to go research mm -hmm. it. I, I had no idea that even happened. Yeah. Uh, and when I heard things like that, I'm sitting there thinking, well, no wonder nobody's paying attention to what we were doing, you know. <laughs> yeah. We had a lot of hot stuff going on. Right. But, uh, as you got to the end of your tour, did you have a short timer's calendar? Were you counting days? Or? Yes, mm -hmm. did uh, very much so. Everybody had pretty much the same thing, and uh, just kind of like a nude lady. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And it had areas that were numbered and stuff, right? <laughs> counted down. And uh, yeah, I held one of those for a while. Uh, As you got toward the end, did you do anything differently or did they change what your duties were? Yes, that did happen. Uh, like uh, January of 71, I mainly did radio relay work. Uh, that is due to a patrol that was on probably around Christmas time. Uh, we started taking fire from across a, a rice paddy and of course we all hit the ground and did our little you know, thing where we're all looking in different mm -hmm. directions and I can remember other night when, when the rounds were zapping over our head and I'm saying oh man not now and uh, I just uh, and I'm sitting there thinking you know all the things are gonna go south here at the last minute and mm -hmm. I'm due to rotate here in a few weeks and uh, I don't know whether the the patrol leader, that lieutenant at the time, I don't think it was him, I think it was Sergeant Doan that did it, I think actually. That, uh, they asked that I be pulled out of the field and, they, and I said, they said, but they knew that I wasn't going to care for not being in the field at all, so they involved me in a uh, hill out in the middle of nowhere again uh, as a radio on a radio relay team so I I was relatively in a secure area I mean other people stood watch I just did the radio operation and stuff there and for was, eight hours and then I would be off for four and then go now back on again. It's radio relay are you picking up reports from people in the field and sending them forward or? Yeah I was actually like one of my my team was out there mm -hmm. a couple of times uh, uh, I'd get, they'd give a sit rep back to me, and then of course I'd be on a different radio relaying it back to the uh, command centers that were tracking them and following what they were doing. I would be anything that they relay or they sent out because they had limited range right. with their thing, but I was within their range, mm -hmm. and then I was within range of the ones in back. Right. So. Uh, so uh, that was interesting too because it, it also gave me another refresher course on that complexity of supporting somebody out there like that, you mm -hmm. know, and how frustrating it is because you know, in my particular case, or I, when something happened with them out there, I knew what they were going through, I knew what they were doing, mm -hmm. and I knew they were running and trying to constantly keep track of where they are so that they could send it, not you know, mm -hmm. encrypted and everything. And, and but I'm now the one that's constantly asking them, you know, for the update, mm -hmm. update your position, update your position, stuff like that, and uh, and knowing full well that that's the last thing they want to hear right now is me mm -hmm. saying, "Tell me where you are." Yeah. <laughs> you <know? laughs> but, Did you ever have problems? Do you think with the enemy in, in intercepting the messages or listening in on you? Not that we know of. I'm, we were always told that it was possible that they were listening. Mm -hmm. uh, the encryption of location, like that changed every day, mm -hmm. so the encryption codes. So I don't think it was that big a problem. Mm -hmm. I, I think I think the the VC, the NBA, all pretty much they had their game plan they were doing and they only dealt with us if we got in the way of it, mm -hmm. you know, of them doing their thing. I don't think they sought us out necessarily that much during the time I was there anyway. Uh, I don't think it was important to them anymore to probe big bases to mm -hmm. find out how they're 
you know, they already knew, okay, you got mm -hmm. planes, you got the superior power and all that stuff, mm -hmm. and they were just simply building up for that, I feel, for that big push at the end there where mm -hmm. they, when they took over. Right, or at least for the push in 72, which yeah. they had. Yeah, that too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so, and, but they're basically the Americans were kind of on their way out and they were sort of maybe letting them go. Yeah, I, I, and again, I liken it to kind of what has been going on in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. uh, they first there, everybody's clashing, everybody's clashing, and all of a sudden they say, hey, if we leave them alone, nothing's happening, they'll leave. Yeah. You know, and I really do think that was the, a lot of the philosophy that was going on. They they continued their build up, but they did it quietly, back mm -hmm. out of the way, not. Don't be obvious about it. Don't make a lot of attacks in areas that really aren't going to change anything. Mm -hmm. Just hide and watch and they'll leave. Yeah. All right. Uh, once you do get down to, to the end, and now do they, Marines were doing 13 month tours for a period. Did you do 13 or did you No, mine was 12. Well, as a matter of fact, it's a week short of 12 months. Okay. It, uh, I was actually in transit my last week of the, I was still overseas, but mm -hmm. it was in Okinawa, you know, right. so. Okay, so now, do you just wake up one day and, and there's orders, okay, today you leave, or tomorrow you get on a chopper, or what happens? Uh, I think I had, like, a, probably a three-day notice that, mm -hmm. okay, this is actually going to take place on Tuesday, or whatever, okay. you know. Um, you know, you know your year's coming up, and mm -hmm. you know they know it, because you're, Always reminding them of it. <laughs> so, so do you just drive back to Da Nang and fly out, or? Yep, uh, pretty much. Uh, just sat down. Oh, they went through the uh, thing of what they call amnesty, where you could dump uh, contraband. Mm -hmm. uh, they had like a booth thing that you walked into. It had fabric hanging both sides, and you'd close it. And there was barrels there. You could just put stuff in and nobody would ask anything. But if you were out the other side of that and you got caught with anything on you, then I don't know what they did then, mm -hmm. send you to Vietnam. I don't know what, yeah. I don't know what they were going to do. But. Uh, <laughs> what what were they looking for? Uh, they didn't want us taking any weapons, mm -hmm. uh, of course any drugs or anything like that. They didn't want any of that to be trafficked out. Uh, Certain souvenirs, which mostly were, you know, any souvenir was a weapon that mm -hmm. you picked up somewhere. Yeah. Uh, ammunition, anything like that, grenades, nothing like that. Uh, they just, they were giving you the last chance. Uh, they'd already let, made it clear to you that was stuff that you could not take mm -hmm. back. And when I walked out, I left most of my stuff right there where it was. In the hooch, mm -hmm. I, I, went, I went down and physically turned in the M16. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, I'd already turned in the sniper rifle mm -hmm. like a month ahead when, when I got put on the radio right. watch. But, uh... Okay. So then, um, then you go to Okinawa and stay there, or...? Spent another four days or three to four days, uh, getting all our stuff out. Uh, everything that we had left in the sea bag had been taken out, repacked in the cardboard boxes. Said something, I don't know, a typhoon or something mm -hmm. gone through and got everything soaked. So we opened it up and it was a mess. So they proceeded to issue us all uh, new uniforms, uh, the, the winter green mm -hmm. uh, dress uniforms. And they're issuing the traps and all that stuff, and I'm sitting there. Why are you doing this? I'm getting out mm -hmm. when I get back. I, I'm not, because I. Uh, they were giving you an early out if you had less than 120 days to do uh, in your enlistment when you got mm -hmm. back to the states. Well, when I figured it up, and it would have been 91 days of all I had left, so I would be eligible for the early out mm -hmm. thing. And I'm sitting there. Why are you giving me all this stuff to go back? And I, what am I going to do with it? Throw it away when mm -hmm. I get there? And, but, that's the, I guess, the military way. Yep. Yeah. Okay. But I managed to come out with uh, the the things that I felt were important, some, some papers and stuff like that. Uh, 
most everything, because uh, we, it was so hot, yet you were freezing a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, it was raining all the time, but it was dry as all get out. <laughs> just, it was a weird country all the way around Vietnam was. It was just, uh, had a smell that you never forget. Uh, I have yet to find it duplicated here, thank God. Now, did but, you notice that when you first got to Da Nang? Or did oh, that... yeah, when the minute that door on the plane opened, it was, oh, it, the air was so thick and heavy, for one mm -hmm. thing. But there was just a, an air, about, it had an odor that was, you know, you noticed it, you tr but you couldn't figure out what was causing it. It must have just been a blend of a whole bunch of things, you know. Mm -hmm. But you got used to it. Uh, I think to a certain extent. Now, was that everywhere or just in the built up areas? Uh, pretty much everywhere, but like I say, as you moved out, see, when you got out in the bush, you got, you got different, uh, so you got the smell of vegetation, mm -hmm. some rotting vegetation. Mm -hmm. uh, there would be certain, uh, like if you were getting close coming up close to a village of some kind, you know, of course you'd get the wood smoke from, uh, from their fires and stuff, you'd smell that right away. Uh, but uh, I don't know whether it was the, the water buffalo or if it was other livestock or what it was, but it had just a peculiar odor to it. it was, there was also a creative use of human waste. Cause of yeah, fertilizer. exactly, yeah. And of course the military burned a lot of human waste in, in diesel fuel, but I guess that would be a more distinctive smell. Yeah, that's pretty much the diesel fuel burning off there. I mean, it, it seems to take care of most of it. But, uh, All right. Uh, now, so you, you got, did you fly back home on another commercial flight? Was it the same deal? Yes, it was, a, it was a commercial flight again. And what was the mood like on the plane? <laughs> It was very, very quiet while we were loading on and everything. Uh, everybody's sweating like crazy because it's still mm -hmm. hot as all get out down there. Uh, you had a tense moment when they, when they closed those doors, that kind of thump the goes. Everybody just, oh, okay, that's all right. That's, it's supposed to do that. Okay, and then everybody just, everybody sat quietly until the wheels come off the ground, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> They went nuts, you know, I'm looking around and why are they all yelling and hollering? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> did they forget something? They want to go back? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> now, was that the plane leaving Da Nang that, that that happened, or was that the one going out of Okinawa? That was Da Nang. Okay, so Dene. Dene. leaving yeah. Vietnam is, yes. is, is the mm -hmm. big thing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then once you get home, do they just process you and Cal to take you back to San Diego or Pendleton or somewhere? Uh, I went to, uh, to an area on Pendleton. I'm not positive which one it was, I think they, they had their area, they had numbered areas, like 14 right. areas, 16 areas, stuff like that. I'm not sure just exactly where I was mm -hmm. there, but uh, we we spent four days while they processed all the paperwork and everything. I guess it took that long for all your records to mm -hmm. catch up with you and everything, and they wanted to make sure everything was together. And those consisted of you get up in the morning, fall out, they count you, make sure you're all there, and they tell you for Christ's sake, don't disappear, be here tomorrow morning. Yep. Uh, we don't want to go looking for you, and you don't probably don't want to be found. So <laughs> just, uh, just stay here, get processed out, get it done. So it was very loose knit. Uh, uh, we were the barracks that we went into and everything. Of course, we were here we are stashing all our gear and everything. Mm -hmm and trying to do it orderly because we think that, you know, we're stateside now, something's going to happen, Nothing. nobody did any inspections mm -hmm. or anything, they didn't worry about it. And we walked off and left most of that stuff in the... Well, I did carry my, put a bit of mine in a sea bag on the way out. I did carry that stuff out. Did they make any effort to get you to re-enlist? It was talked about uh, to the degree of if you choose, if, if you're thinking about re-enlisting, they told us who it was we had to go see, mm -hmm. and seriously considered it for a couple of days there. I sat and thought about it and thought about it, and I did ask, uh, I think it was a staff sergeant at one point, I said, what, what, what are the chances that I would go back to first recon? He said, probably you, won't get the, you wouldn't get the mm -hmm. same duty station. 
And I thought, well, if I can't go back there, then maybe I, I really don't want to do it. Uh, uh, I think at first I asked him what was the chances of going back to Vietnam, and he mm -hmm. said, well, very good. He says, uh, even though they're pulling back, or they're supposedly pulling out, we still need, you know, you with E4 with combat experience, mm -hmm. you probably go right back. And, uh, but what he didn't say, and I found out later, was that if I had gone back, they would probably put me in a relatively secure area mm -hmm. in some kind of a support function. Right. And I don't think I'd have cared for that anyway. So I was kind of glad I didn't go back in. But. All right. Uh, so now they process you at Pendleton, uh, then back to Michigan from there? Uh, yeah, I left uh, Pendleton, came back, uh, landed in Chicago, and I swear it was sideways, and we were having an awful, Midwest having awful storms mm -hmm. back, or at then, at the end of January in 71, uh, and uh, Kind of freaked me out the way the whole thing went and everything, but uh, what did I do then? I think I, think I caught a bus to Grand Rapids after that. Mm -hmm. Or no, was I down? Yeah, I can't remember if I flew back to Grand Rapids or not. I, it seems to me there was two planes involved, but. But anyway, you, but, you went home. Yeah, anyway, I come back home. Okay. Yeah. And then at that point, uh, did you go look for work, or what did you do after you were home? I beat around for about a week and a half, and that was enough of that. And yeah, I went back to where I and worked at Romer Yachts when I was drafted. I went back there, the personnel guy. Uh, I went in to see him. He says, "Well, he says, you know, we've had some real bad cutbacks." He says, "Even if we, if you'd have stayed, you would have been out. We've we've laid off people that were way above you in seniority already." But he says, uh, he "says Hang on just a minute." He says, "I know another fellow over here. What was it? Home furnace." Uh, and. Uh, he called over and said, okay, he's got a guy here, he says, I can't give him his job back, he wants to go to work, do you have anything for him? He said, yeah, send him over. So I went over there and went on a production line making uh, furnaces for house trailers, or assembling them, and hated it. Oh, it was horrible being inside and mm -hmm. on that assembly line. And then one day I was over in Allegan and friend of mine had known all my life, he'd worked for General Telephone, leaned out the window and said, hey, they need a lineman, get over there and put in an application. Mm -hmm. So I went over and did that and got on with uh, General Telephone. And did that until I had a car wreck one night. After we'd been, we'd had an ice storm in March of 72. And I worked late. I guess I took a nap at the wheel, you know, mm -hmm. head on to the canteen beverage truck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of screwed me up because I was still toying with the idea of maybe going back in because mm -hmm. uh, I bounced, you know, three jobs in that short time. And I, that was back when, you know, having several jobs was a sign of instability. Mm -hmm. Not now it's a brand of honor. Uh, and because I was having trouble adjusting to that and liking what I was trying to find something that I liked to do, I was think I was really seriously considering going back in, but I smashed the daylights out on one side here, so that was out. I knew I wouldn't get back in mm -hmm. that. And in seventy two things were changing over there too, mm -hmm. so and uh, the Middle East was well, it's always been a hotbed but it was starting to broil up more. Yeah, you get another war in 73 and, yeah. and the economy is pretty bad there for a while. Exactly. Did, did you eventually settle into one kind of career track or did you kind of just do a Well, I, uh, after my that record laid me up for quite a while, for over a year, I spent uh, six months on a body cast and um, the next six, eight months on crutches and well, I was doing, when I finally got to the crutch point, I said, well, maybe I'll just use the GI Bill and I'll go to school. And I went to Western for
for two terms and uh, aviation engineering. What I was trying to do was just become an airplane mechanic. Mm -hmm. That's all I wanted to do. I didn't want to get into the, you know, like design and right. development and right. all that. But uh, it, that didn't work out well. Uh, your educational regimentation does not fit well with the uh, with me anyway, mm -hmm. uh, I just uh, used to doing things because there's a reason to do it, not just because somebody thinks it's a good idea. And I just didn't, I guess I just didn't fit in the mm -hmm. academic end of things. So I just dropped that after a couple months and uh, went down and picked up a job in South Haven building these blueberry shaker machines. And they started losing orders there and so I thought, well, I'll try back up north, and I went to work at uh, Lifesaver Candy Plant in 74, and stayed there for 25 years. All right. Now, to look back at the time that you spent in the service, so what kind of effect do you think that wound up having on you? Oh, that was definitely my formative years, you know, like a lot of people say they grow up when they go to college and stuff. I guess that was my growing up college term, you know. It, uh, it, it definitely gives you a different outlook on things and what, what then what others see it as being. And that I could really <clears throat> have the evidence by going to Western. That, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I could see where, how, how different people looked at things and uh, how I looked at them. And, uh, and when, I, when I got at Lifesavers there, and I started working up, you know, through the job there and doing different things. Uh, I think it gave me a high degree of self-discipline to, to get something that I felt was worth going after. I, I did a lot of union work there. Uh, I was president of the local for a couple of years. Uh, uh, chief steward from the plant from I don't know, eight, ten years, something like that, and then I wound up, uh, wound up in the boiler room there as a sole operator on third shift, or sole person in the building, as a matter of fact, on third shift for quite a while, and I was right back to. I was starting to get some some problems, I think, from that being isolated again. Mm -hmm. uh, I was I was starting to fight some some demons that I couldn't even imagine, and well, once uh, pretty much they went to sell the place off. Well, Nabisco did, and I I got tired of waiting for the shoe to drop where they were laying people off mm -hmm. and stuff. And at that point, I was a supervisor, production supervisor, in the management end of things, and. Uh, I I just went in one day and said I I've had enough of it. You're looking for a couple of people to dismiss. You know, mm -hmm. they kept coming back every yeah. every other week and saying, okay, we got your two out of this area, two out of this mm -hmm. area, trying to do the lean and mean thing to posture themselves for selling. And I just finally said, uh, I've had enough of it. I said, I'm going to go. And I went to work with my kid brother. He owns his own gravel business over here, and uh, worked with him for a couple of years. And then, still having an awful time. Uh, I wasn't sleeping well. Mm -hmm. wasn't having a hard time adjusting. And I, I belonged to the Vietnam Veterans Chapter there in, uh, in Holland, mm -hmm. and I had been their treasurer since 1993. I still am. And I got to talking to one of the members, and he said come with me and he took me up to the VA center mm -hmm. in uh, Grand Rapids or the clinic and right into the mental health area and I sat and talked to a lady named Harriet and she just she says just a minute I've got to have you talk to a psychiatrist she says I know what's the matter with you but I can't diagnose mm -hmm. <laughs> no. talked to a fellow named Kuipers and and within an hour, they were getting me enrolled in the system up there and everything, and uh, 
started explaining this thing called PTSD mm -hmm. that I had heard very little about, you know, didn't know what that meant, or, and I guess I was a prime candidate. What I've been telling people since then is that I went to the VA, went to mental health, and they kept me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. All right. But I've been learning a lot about it. I've uh, been doing this vet to vet program now. Uh, it's been very, very beneficial to me and and to, I think to a lot of the other guys. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the fellows that headed it up both happened to be gone last week, so they asked me to conduct it and everything. Mm -hmm. So I did that. And uh, matter of fact, we have a meeting tonight. Now I think I'm conducting that one too, unless the one guy is back or not this week. But, uh, there's been a readjustment period. There's a lot of things that were in the back of my mind and. Uh, bugging the daylights out of me that were trying to fight their way out and I was fighting just as hard to keep them in mm -hmm. and I found out I don't have to do that. And things have been really relaxing here because I, I think I told you earlier about finding the new end family and everything. Mm -hmm. Well that was all happening at the same time I was getting involved in this and just things were turning around totally in my life after, after, after 35 years and virtually beating my head against the wall, you know. Uh, made a lot of difference. Yeah. Been very nice. So you came out of Vietnam physically in one piece and a whole lot, you know, and really very functional and everything else. You could go, you could do jobs, you could do all right. of that kind of stuff. Uh, but you, there's still stuff that just kind of carried around with you. Yeah, a lot of it had to do with other people. Mm -hmm. uh, other people irritated the crap out of me, man. It just and, and really all it was is a difference of opinion of what priorities mm -hmm. were, you know, like I said, with the education and, right, the, right. and the military regimentation and education regimentation are two different things is the way I see it. And I, and I couldn't meld them together, <laughs> you know, just. All right. Anything else you want to throw out of the record here before we uh, close out the interview? I don't know. I uh, just... That uh, it it was a it was a very uh, character forming experience for me, mm -hmm. and I don't regret it. There were some things I probably should not have done, uh, but I'm not. I don't lose any sleep over that type of stuff. Uh, it's all a learning curve. Uh, I encourage anybody, anybody who has, uh, who is, feels like they're battling uphill to get in touch with the VA and let them help them. Uh, and to not be ashamed about what you did. Uh, tackle it and even if it means you have to relive it for a few moments like this, this mm -hmm. is, this was done on the encouragement of two of my friends, mm -hmm. and uh, right now I'm feeling better. I feel better having done what I've done. So, okay. well, you, you've certainly done a good job telling your story. So I just like to thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. And thank you. I, I appreciate what you're doing here. I think this is a great, this is a great project, I, I, and I hope uh, a lot of people take advantage of it. All right. Thank you. Thank you.